Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. Every episode of Mindfield is now free to view all over the world. All 24 episodes, all three seasons. Ooh, it is really exciting. And it's why I've invited you here to Vsauce headquarters. Why watch Mindfield alone when you could watch it with me and some of the researchers, writers, scientists, and teachers who are in the episodes who made Mindfield what it is? That's right, we are about to have ourselves a Mindfield marathon. We're going to watch three episodes in their entirety, pausing throughout to talk more deeply about the concepts in the episodes. It's gonna be very exciting and it's all going to happen right in here. Follow me. After you. We're going to begin with an episode that helped new research happen and improved the lives of some very special children. Season two, episode six, The Power of Suggestion. This is McGill University in Montreal, Canada. It boasts an enrollment of more than 40,000 students from 150 countries. The campus employs 1,700 professors teaching 300 programs of study, and it's proud to be home to 12 Nobel Prize winners. It is considered one of the finest research universities in the world. Recently, researchers at McGill have embarked on a study that uses a brain scanning device to read people's minds and implant thoughts into their heads. Or so their subjects think. Now, the same device may be able to help kids with ADHD, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, migraines, Tourette's, and more. This study is not about technology. The MRI machine behind me may look impressive, but it's a sham. It's deactivated, non-functioning. What this study is really about is faith in science. It's about the power of thoughts to heal. All you need is the power of suggestion. A placebo is something that shouldn't work, but due to the power of suggestion and because of the strength of our belief, does. But we don't fully understand yet how they work there could be an evolutionary explanation. For example, if a small child hurts themselves, negative symptoms like pain and crying can be good. They keep the child safe and still while signaling adults to come help. When help arrives, even if it has no active effect, the child's brain may feel it has permission to redirect resources away from seeking help and on to actually healing. Modern medicine has found a way to harness this power by prescribing placebos. But not all placebos work the same. For example, a sugar pill will help your headache more if given to you by a doctor than by a poker buddy. And the color of the placebo matters too. A blue pill will work to make you feel calm better than a white pill, because blue is a more calming color. And a red pill will keep you awake and give you more energy than a blue pill will. A capsule will work better than a pill because it looks more important. And we're gonna stop right there because one of my guests already has a comment. Let me first introduce who the guests are. Daniel Toker is a PhD candidate at Berkeley who has been writing and researching for Mindfield at least season two and three. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And the fear episode, season four. And the fear episode, which isn't even out yet, but it might be by the time you watch this, in which case it's out already. Thanks, Daniel. On the far right side, we have Elizabeth DeClear, who worked on season three mm -hmm. as a producer, writer. She's a science communicator, science documentary filmmaker. But I saved the middle for last because Dr. Samuel Vessier from the Culture, Mind, and Brain Lab at McGill University, one of the co-directors, is here and he's also going to be featured quite prominently in this episode, you'll see him soon. And he's the one who told me, stop, let's talk, because we're gonna talk about placebos. And I just mentioned in the episode that the color of a pill affects how it can make you feel. A blue pill will tend to be more calming because so many of us associate blue with calming. However, 
We need to be, we need to put a star on so many of us. Yeah, so reportedly in Italy, blue pills don't have a calming effect because people associate the color blue uh, with the, uh, the soccer jersey of the national soccer team. So they tend to associate it with a kind of a feeling of arousal and not calmness. So it's interesting to try to parse out, you know, the different effects of some colors. Red seems fairly universal as something that uh, triggers high arousal, um, but not blue. Is that because red is the color of blood, you think? I'm really not sure. I mean, as you know, we seem to have some inbuilt attentional biases towards red, like say the little uh, buzzing red lights on smartphones work really well that way because we tend to automatically attend to them. It could be blood, yeah, it could be fire even, because we also have an attentional bias towards fire. Right. Wait, but how, how universal is this? Have studies looked at uh, Papua New Guinea and, and, and populations there that have, don't watch the movies and don't have the stories that we have in America or in Europe. I mean, is this something that, you said inbuilt. Is it really? I'm not aware of all the studies. I think red for sure is something for which we have a relatively innate attentional bias. Huh. Uh, you, red is, is uh, processed as salient in the environment. So much of it depends on the person. Like, there could be a person here in America for whom red is really calming because of their particular circumstances. Yeah, it's actually funny. I just got back from China yesterday. So I flew in and one of the things you notice even from the sky looking down over Chinese cities is how much red lighting there is, mm. like red LEDs. And so I associate red with stop. Like if red, it's, it's mm. meant to catch my attention. It's sort of alarming. But in China actually it's ubiquitous and it must be, it's more just like a color of good luck. Most right, restaurants right. have their you know, the title of the restaurant in red. Um, so it's also meant to catch your attention, to stimulate arousal, but in less of like a negative way that it can sometimes be here in the United States. The red yes, street sign yeah. isn't necessarily so guys, gonna be. So probably the emotional valence is conditioned and culturally contingent on some level, but that red is gonna be salient, is gonna be something that we kind of automatically attend to, that's fairly universal. And once we attend to it, how we feel may depend a lot on the culture that we're from. Right. But I think the point is that even things like the color and size and shape yeah. of a pill and who gives it to you will affect how it yeah. works. It's oh, yeah. not just the chemical properties of the medicine. There's so much more, so much in the mental world. Well, I mean, but that also is chemical ultimately, right? Because if it's, if it's a blue pill or a red pill, that's gonna affect your neurochemistry in some way. And you know what? Why is it red or blue? Because of the physical shape of the molecules? Right. The shape, right. wow. So, <laughs> right. I guess this is gonna be a question I wanna keep coming back to. How do we really define a placebo? Because I, I think in the episode I say something like there's no active ingredient that should cause that effect, mm -hmm. but yet if a pill is calming because it happens to be blue, because its molecular structure reflects blue light the best, then there is something chemically right. in that pill that works in calming you. And it's not because the, the ingestion helps. It's just the color alone. Right, right. I guess it's easier to define what's not a placebo as something that huh. works better than a placebo. Well, that's why another term for placebo effects are non-specific effects or non-specific factors. So whatever factors involved in healing that we cannot attribute to the chemical substance that is targeted in, in the treatment. And there are also non-specific effects in psychotherapy even that, that are so, so tone of voice, setting, you know, mm -hmm. waiting mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. So placebo is really a filler term for all these different psychosocial, symbolic, ritual factors that we don't fully understand, but that we know contribute to a cure somehow. Right. So those are called non-specific. Non-specific. The specific ones, how are they defined? They are... So the specific one would be the actual analgesic property of a pill, for example, that's been well studied in RCT. We, we know it produces that effect. But then we know that there are other effects around and beyond that, that also contribute to healing. And in the case of a, an actual placebo procedure where we know that specific molecule is not actually present in the pill, but healing will still happen, then we need to investigate those different effects, those right. different factors okay, so that a, are non-specific. Maybe this works. A non-specific, non-placebo effect of a medicine would be what works even when it's administered to someone in a coma who doesn't know what's happening, doesn't know who's mm. administering it, but we know that that molecule in the blood causes blood pressure to go down or whatever, causes pain to be felt less, I don't know. But be careful because there are 
pl uh, placebo effects have been found, for example, in nonverbal autistic children who for sure cannot understand the nature of the suggestion. Because, of course, if you have some kind of an idea about uh, a, a therapeutic target and a mechanism of action, so I have a headache and this one pill removes the headache, then that will greatly help in the placebo effect. But what about the case of autistic, nonverbal children who have no idea, yeah. who don't expect anything, and yet there's an effect. There's a socio-cognitive component to placebo effects. You have to be able to expect what other people expect of you, even implicitly. So probably in the case of the nonverbal autistic children, it's also, say, the reassuring tone of voice of the parent, the parent's shifted expectations, the sort of contagious hope that might work. And the same, might, uh, same mechanism, same social mechanism might be involved in dogs and in advanced social species through observation and kind of social emotional contagion. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right, guys, let's get back into the episode. You ready? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Uh, also, an injection will work better than a capsule because it seems more serious and potent. There's even evidence that fake or sham surgeries have positive effects. It may be fake medicine, but the effects can be real. And not just because the patient feels better psychologically. We're talking real physical healing, thanks to the power of the brain. So again, briefly, can I say something, Michael? Yeah, let's stop. Well, I'm really glad you're pointing out all these different dimensions of placebo effects. The take home point here is that the more elaborate the procedure, the better it works. And by elaborate, I mean, so technologically elaborate, uh, but also motivationally elaborate. So if it hurts a little bit, if you have to wait a long time for it, if it seems really symbolically prominent also, so whatever, whatever prestige might be attached to a procedure, that'll tend to work better, and also socially elaborate. So um, if you can notice improvements in other people, preferably mm. people like you, people from your in-group, you can talk to them, that'll also help prepare you for the placebo response. It's amazing, it makes it feel like why even study real medicine when so much of just the way people think about it can make a difference. Clearly there are limits to that. And I wanna revisit that when we start looking at the actual study that we did in this episode, because talk about making it feel technologically uh, interesting. We've got a whole film crew there. Why would a film crew be here unless it's gonna work well? We'll talk about that soon. We'll get right back into it, the power of suggestion. I traveled to Montreal to meet local children struggling with debilitating behavioral and neurological conditions who would soon find out whether their afflictions could be cured by the power of suggestion. This is Hi. Malaya. Malaya, I'm Michael, nice to meet oh. you. 12-year-old Malaya suffers from a common skin ailment, eczema, but she has also developed a skin picking disorder, dermatillomania. And you're starting high school, what, like this year? Early September. Wow, that's a big step. So what kind of things like worry you, uh, given the symptoms that you have? Probably the picking. Of your skin? Yeah, I don't know, I find it satisfying to pick. It's kind of gross. Why do you think you can't stop? I'm not sure. Have you tried different things that'll help you stop? Yeah, like in my mind, I'm just like, today you won't pick, you are gonna get rid of this eczema, and then after I'm just like, Oh wait, my face is like bleeding. Yeah, um, then, is it embarrassing? Yeah, I like to wear long sleeves because my arms are like, if they're really bad, I'm gonna try to wear long sleeves. How are your arms now? Uh, it's like really bad, so as you can see. And that's see, all just from scratching and picking? Yeah. 12 year old Nicholas was troubled by debilitating migraine headaches. So what do you want to be when you grow up? Like I really, really want to be uh, probably like an NHL or an MLB player, one of those two. Nicholas's love of sports is unfortunately also the original source of his suffering. Nice. To put in my first head injury, which was a concussion, I hit my head on a soccer post. And then I hit my head in a game of uh, hockey. Uh, after that, I had headaches every single day. I was throwing up, having auras, they're like uh, colors that you see before you have a headache. I wasn't able to go to school, and then we went to the hospital and into their concussion program. Can I see his migraine chart? Oh, sure. Yeah, we have almost two years worth. And severe headaches here. Severe Every migraines. day. Every single day. This has turned his world upside down. Nathan was diagnosed with ADHD and impulse control disorder. I'd love to hear, especially about you, Nathan. First of all, how old are you? Nine. Nine. How old you are? How old do you think I am? Thirty. 
That's a very good guess. I'm 31. Ooh. So tell me about like before Nathan's diagnosis, what were kind of the symptoms you were seeing? Tantrums all the time. Um, just an inability to, to reach him, to communicate to him, to connect to him. That was the main symptom. And what did you think of this, Nathan? Were you like, why are my parents not happy? Because I was not listening. Why weren't you? I don't know. Maybe because I had problems. And as far as like behavior? Impulsivity, hyperactivity. You're always, always on the edge, You're always stressed. What is he gonna touch? Where is he gonna go? What is he gonna do? These families had tried conventional methods to treat their children with little success. But they were about to find out whether their symptoms could be alleviated using an accessory-assisted placebo, a fake non-functioning MRI machine. This groundbreaking study of the power of suggestion in action is the brainchild of pioneering researchers at McGill University's esteemed RAS Lab. We study a whole bunch of different mind-body interaction topics, suggestion, hypnosis, placebo effects. Anytime the mind is regulating the body or, or vice versa, that that's a topic that we study. Now you said the word placebo, and the device that we are using is a sham scanner. Tell me about the scanner. What we do with the MRI scanner is we stack so many different layers of deception. In their head, this is a proper neuroscience study done at the Neurological Institute, and that's why we wear lab coats. That's, that's why we have all of this scientific-looking equipment. By the time they actually started the study, they've already, in their mind, built up all these different layers of credibility. They really believe that, that, that what we're doing is real. What's interesting is that children, they're not immune to the power of neuroenchantment. Neuroenchantment? Neuroenchantment. What does that mean? So it's this idea that there is some kind of medical magic. There is immense power that is attached to the culture of neuroscience, whereby neuroscientific props and accessories have more healing power, more physiological effects, because culturally people believe that they do. I mean, the same kinds of cultural cognitive mechanisms are at play in religious systems. So here we are praying to the gods of neuroscience and biomedicine. Talk to me about the ethics of lying. The work we do with children actually does not involve lying. We tell them at first that everything that they see and everything that we do in the lab is a suggestion. We explain to them that suggestion is a way to tap into the power of their mind. And we keep emphasizing, even as they go in the scanner, that it is their mind and their brain that is doing the healing, that they're basically reprogramming their own brain. The parents knew that the scanner was a placebo, but for the study to work, the children had to believe in the procedure. So before they visited the lab, I enlisted a few YouTuber friends to help raise their expectations. Hey guys, today we have a huge surprise for you about something brand new in science that could affect you today. Oh, I know them. Well, today we learned about this amazing new machine that teaches kids' brains how to heal super fast. We really hope that you get the chance in person to see how this machine works. With a little help from the machine, you can focus better, you can be more confident, and it can even take away some headaches. Awesome. Not too many people get the chance to have this awesome experience, but we hear the scientists in Canada. I'm going to have it? Yeah, and it's very cool. So what do you hope the machine allows you to do? It makes you better at? Better at concentrating, better at focusing. I want to heal faster, and this would probably be a good idea. All right, so I want to talk about a couple of things. One, this episode is really different from a lot of Minefield episodes because we're treating people in it, and we're following their stories. A ungenerous way to look at this is that in this episode, we're lying to children and performing fake medicine on children. Dr. Vessier, what are your thoughts? So if you carefully examine what we say, it is correct that we never tell a lie, um, that we explain the mechanism correctly. However, to be completely honest, we do probably rely on the children's, to some extent, uncritical faith in the healing power of the machine on the one hand and their own brain. And this is because we know it is very effective for people to be able to relax their worries and their critical thinking and to surrender to some kind of an idea that they have of an external locus of control. Now, note here how 
both the brain and the machine are basically an agency other than their conscious self. So we tell them, you know, the machine will help your brain heal itself. It is your brain that is doing the healing. But it is much more efficient uh, for the children to at least initially believe that the machine is some kind of special power. I think I re even remember you telling me that you would tell the parents flat out, the machine's not even plugged in. Absolutely. And then the next day that they came in, they would say, but is this safe? Because how can it be safe? We're in the basement of a neuroscience lab and this machine is really big and noises are being played. Not they even that, they would ask, so did you find out what's wrong with my child's brain? They, they wanted us to comment on neuroimaging results and we would have to, you know, pull them aside again and say, do, do you remember, we're not doing actual neuroimaging, you know, we're, we're not uh, competent to comment on findings that are not even there. They would forget. They would forget. They would forget because all the cues are in place. And I think it, it, you know, it would demand so much mental effort hmm. to remember that this is sham, that people revert to a kind of adaptive self-deception. So this is also what we're aiming for. We're aiming to tap into the children's ability to self-deceive, which we know is, can be very effective. Like say, if you're really, really nervous before giving a talk and then you manage to convince yourself that you're not nervous, then lo and behold, you start feeling confident. Mm -hmm. Now, initially, there might have been some self-deception, but then if the results are good, then it's no longer deception. This is what I really love about all the episodes and all the work that we've done together. Because uh, we also worked on the um, <laughs> reverse exorcism, mm -hmm. putting a spirit mm -hmm. in someone. That, okay, in a way we're almost finding some truth to pseudoscientific practices. If I have some, some mental block or some behavior I don't want, and you know, my mother takes me to a person who prays to crystals and whatever. That crystal has no chemical mechanism with which to help me. However, if I truly believe that this is significant and I notice that I'm being cared for, that people care so much and I think so much more about my behavior because of all of that, I can actually get better. And that's what we're doing here, but instead of using crystals and whatever, we're using science-looking stuff. Lab coats and an MRI and uh, imaging of brains on the computer screens around, and it just feels like this must be serious and real. But in reality, they may as well be laying on a bed while someone sings nonsense words to them. And, and I, I like the parallel that you draw. It's true that a lot of spiritual healing practices, they draw on this... Um, you know, these transitional objects, you could call them so things like amulets or stones or rocks or, or even magic, you know, crosses that people can sort of attribute healing power to without having to worry. Uh, it becomes a convenient way to instill hope in people. All right, well, let's get right back into it. I hope it heals me with my concussions and now I hope my headaches go away. I was about to take part in something remarkable the very first use of accessory-assisted suggestion on children with these kinds of symptoms. Mindfield would play an integral role in the study, and the results could be new and significant for science. On the day of the first session, several measures were put in place to heighten the children's neuroenchantment. Nathan. A friendly fake nurse. A walk down a long, impressive hallway. And a 10-minute anticipation building wait outside the lab. Then it was time for their first scan. Shall we? While the hypothesis of this study was grounded in science, this was Dr. Vessier and Jay Olson's first time testing their theory on real children with real disorders and they didn't know if it would work. You may lie down if you'd like. I have a question. So it seems to me that placebos work in part because people, these subjects have a lot of faith in medical science. Um, did you study that at all or ask them at all about that? I mean, and I guess my question is, um, for somebody who's very skeptical of medical science, who doesn't feel like um, doctors are working to their benefit, would they still be as susceptible to a placebo? Well, a lot of people might say they're critical in medical science, but for example, if they have acute appendicitis, their first intuition will be to uh, rush to the ER. And for a belief to be really effective, it needs to be culturally widespread. And we happen to live in a historical moment where most of the solutions uh, to our everyday you know, ailments 
are deemed to be found in medicine. And children are receptive to these kinds of cues, even implicitly, even if they don't know that they know. So I think, you know, try it out at home, for example, if you have like a five-year-old niece, show her a picture of uh, a builder and then uh, a doctor with a stethoscope and, and ask your niece, you know, which one is the smartest? For sure, they're going to point to the doctor because they've picked up on a cultural consensus that this is where, you know, elaborate knowledge lies. At the same time, I'm not aware of any studies uh, testing medical placebos on people who are really skeptical of medicine, who are completely into alternative medicine. It may be that it wouldn't work with them. It, it's, I think it's a good hypothesis. Also, is there such a thing as an anti-placebo? Where, <laughs> and what I mean by There's that? A, oh, no, placebo, like, for sure. Yeah, okay. So that's like somebody who, um, who's, so, who's skeptical. So even something that's potent, even if you give them a potent drug, they don't react to it. Because they're mm, so that's, skeptical yeah, right. about that's it. That's another thing. Nocebo is something different. What is that, though, where because of all the non-specific crap surrounding a chemical mechanism that should work, it works less well because of the context? That's really interesting. Yeah, that's Might. very, very interesting. And it may be that people who are a little too high in analytical reasoning, people who are not very suggestible, people who are not very prone to social influence, uh, may also reverse placebo themselves inadvertently because they're too critical, because they can't let uh, the self-regulatory magic happen. But it could be that at the social level, our naive beliefs in some things like, say, some categories of illness that may not be scientifically very validated, but just because people believe they have these symptoms, like, say, certain food intolerances or certain allergies that appear to be on the rise, well, there are some psychogenic factors involved in that, and that might have something to do with collective nocebo effects. Mm. And, th and the next problem is also uh, letting people know that they're genetically at risk for a particular condition ah. sometimes may trigger the symptoms or may even trigger the condition in, in a way that not knowing might have been better. Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance so. is often bliss. Like it's very ethically tricky then. It's huh. very ethically tricky because you have to tell people, yeah. but then there are also risks associated with, with telling. And that's why you might not want to do a personal genetics test. Right. Well, we're about to test uh, that in the lab as well because we think there's interesting neuroenchantment effects associated with belief in genetics. So uh, we're about to do a study with uh, sham personalized feedback. So, oh, wow. so sham, you know, swab and, and, and genetic. And it, it's basically like a, a pain nocebo condition as well where, oh, sorry, no, it's a, it's a placebo analgesia condition. So we tell, so we, you know, we give people a shock and pain and we tell them that uh, in, in one condition, uh, we've tailored the machine to one particular genetic polymorphism that they have, and we fully expect that it's going to work better in that condition, but we, we haven't tested it yet. And then eventually, one of our dreams is to also test in a kind of a you know, three-arm trial to do sham neuroimaging versus cha sham genetic testing to see which one has the strongest effects. Ah, what's your hypothesis? Mm. Which do you think we as a society believe more in, neuroimaging or genetic testing? I'm really not sure. I, I think... We're moving towards believing more in genetic testing, but the belief might still be culturally new, whereas belief in the power of neuroscience are very well installed culturally. You know, yeah. We're more than you know, two decades after the decade of the brain. So I would say in 10 years, it'll probably be sham well, genetic testing. For now, it depends on levels of, of exposure. Yeah. Uh, but for sure, like say for children, the idea of a gene is still very, very opaque, very nebulous, very esoteric, whereas putting them in this enormous machine in this authoritative hospital might... Might always be better yeah. than just swabbing their mouth and yeah. telling them something. Mm -hmm. Let's get back into the episode. You guys ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. One of my roles was to help build up the children's belief that it would work. As you go into the machine, you'll relax more and more. Would you like to relax slowly or quickly today? Uh, I can go in quickly. Quickly? Oh, wow, okay. nice. Very good. Although the MRI scanner was completely deactivated, we needed the kids to believe it was fully functional. So Jay played a series of realistic sound effects to signify that the machine was working, while Dr. Bessier planted the suggestion that it would help the patient heal. You might notice some unusual feelings perhaps a tingling. Your brain is continuing to learn and to heal and to help you find this constant feeling of confidence. 
If all went well, the placebo effect of the sham brain scanner would convince the children's conscious minds that real neuroscience was at work. A deep, deep breath. This would allow their subconscious minds to harness the power of their brains to heal themselves. For people with migraines, it's, it's often in the front or the back part of the head, but it could also be like a feeling like outside the head. So I'm not sure what it's going to be like for you. We'll find out afterwards. So we'll now slide you in. Cool, it's like a roller coaster. I love roller coasters. The deeper you go in, the more you'll relax. Okay, I want to go all the way deep. I feel yeah. more stronger beeps. I know. This is because you're already at level three. You might notice a deeper feeling of relaxation. Yes, yes. I can feel it. Can we go a little bit deeper, please? Yes. Oh, my whole entire feet. Nice. The scientists at McGill believe the children's brains have always had the ability to control their symptoms. The children just needed to believe it themselves. <coughs> yeah, so the beeps can sometimes make people sneeze as a sign that they're relaxing just very deeply. Right. You did very well. Yeah. You did very, very well, Nathan. The children all appeared to enjoy the procedure, and the researchers and I did our best to reinforce their neuroenchantment. So when you heard the, f the first set of beeps and the second set of beeps, did you notice feeling them in different parts of your body? Well, the first time I went in the machine, I kind of felt it here. OK, good. What level was, was she taken to today? Level two. Level yeah, two? Yeah, level two is great, yeah. Mm. Yeah. When I was in the machine, I felt like I was going like backwards and forwards. OK, that's very good. That's a very good sign. You might have noticed how you were yawning. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. For a kid with hyperactivity, Nathan was already appearing calmer. But before our young subjects left the lab, Dr. Vessier bolstered the suggestion that today's session would help them continue their healing process. So I know for sure that you're going to be more relaxed, much, much less anxious. I would not be surprised at all if the scratching really diminished to no scratching at all. The amazing thing about the brain is that it has this fantastic power to heal itself. But now what we've been able to do here with the power of suggestion is to get your brain to work faster and better all the time. So how do you feel? Amazing. <laughs> oh, nice. Mindfield provided the Raz Lab with Octopus by Joy smartwatches. Lefty rules. They were specially programmed to remind the children in between visits that their brain was healing itself. Just having the watch with you will make you feel better. But it's not the watch or it's not the machine that's making you feel good, it's your own brain. Okay, I just stopped it because I wanna say, at this time when this was filmed, smartwatches were like a whole cool brand new thing. Everyone was excited. The kids were like, oh, I get that. And we had to be like, it's not like an Apple watch. It's just for your brain health, which is better. Tell me about the watches, because I don't think in the episode we focus enough on what their role was. The idea was to work on placebo conditioning. So first we elicited a response in the scanner with a mixture of hypnotic suggestions and anticipations and all the effects that you showed. Now, once we've found a target response, like say relaxation or you know, self-regulation in some other way, then we get the kids to expect that when they receive a little buzz from the watch, they're going to keep experiencing whatever effect we were eliciting. So usually respect, relaxation, uh, focus, and so forth. So then we programmed different uh, delivery schedules for the children where they would get a little buzz and a little friendly icon, and then it would remind them, oh, I guess I'm doing great. And then we had them come back after two weeks in the lab where I would decrease the de delivery schedule uh -huh. of the buses because I didn't want them to become too addicted to them. And eventually, after a third week, there would be no more buses. So they could play around with the icons because I didn't want them to rely on the, on the buses. Uh, but then, yeah, as you point out, a lot of the kids still wanted to have the watch as, as a kind of a, a transitional object, like a little blankie, you know, that mm -hmm. helps you sleep, or, or an amulet, or a special ring that people have. You may have heard us say a few times, ooh, you're at level three. Yeah. Today you got to level two. It was completely made up. Yeah. There were no levels. But yet the kids really read a lot into that. And then they became more and more proud each time they, you know, they went deeper and they <laughs> surrendered themselves well, to the... Of course they did, because no matter 
what happened or how they felt, they were told, that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Oh, really? We so were validating everything we felt. Everything. Was the level thing planned or does that, was that improvised on camera? No, we kind of, I think we improvised it on camera and then we, we stuck to it because we saw that it worked really well. Well, yeah, I just with allowed uh, Samuel to guide the whole thing. I sat there and I would just back him up. I'm wearing a lab coat as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So I go, ah, oh, oh wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, he would just, it, would, it was almost hard sometimes to not laugh because he'd be like, ah, yes, well, you know, um, oh, you feel sleepy? Oh, that means you're very advanced. And I'd be like, he says that about everything. Yeah. <laughs> it was so Great. funny. Um, and I was always excited to see what level he would say they reached because it gave me a sense of how much further you wanted to go with them. Right, right. And because uh, as you remember, we had many more kids than what we ended up showing on camera. Yeah, and let's we, talk and about we, that And we too. had great results with all of them. Right, so let's talk about that. So you see three children featured here in this episode, mm -hmm. but I believe there were seven, eight, or nine that we actually worked with. There were 12. There were 12, mm -hmm. okay? Not all 12 could fit into the time constraints in that episode. That's partly why I wanna have this marathon, so we can talk more. You remember Mikey? Mm -hmm. Really, really hyper, really difficult to get him in the machine, and still, there were lots and lots of improvements at home. He was able to take a shower for the first time. He made a friend at camp, and the watch in particular worked really well with him because he was very focused on it and, I, and I, I made him work really hard to earn that watch. So by the time he got the watch, he was already going in the machine, he was calmer, he was more respectful to his dad. And I think I remember the parents, uh, the dad saying, okay, so we reached a point where your goal was to get the watch off the kid. That you don't need the watch after all. Your own brain, your own self can control mm -hmm. this, but people really want those accessories. And the parents were like, well, I mean, could you tell them to keep it on? Because it keeps the kid calm and it makes them more thoughtful and it makes them more aware of their behavior. You have kids, right? Mm -hmm. Do you use any of these tactics on your own kids? Absolutely. Our very first <laughs> subject was my son, uh, Mateus, who suffered from chronic migraines. And we did a lot of work on him, and we had amazing results uh, on his chronic migraines. Mateus couldn't, he couldn't make it in the final cut of the episode, but he also helped in the initial study as a child mentor. Because we found that a lot of the kids were terrified of getting into the machine, but then if they could speak to another child who had gone through the procedure and who could talk about how fun and safe it was and how he'd gotten better, then we were able to have much better results. So we used this kind of peer mentoring strategy that we're still using actually um, in the studies that we're running now. But yeah, for sure, I, I use these kinds of tricks and, and I give placebos to my children, you know, <laughs> all the time. And then, and then you have your kids peddle the placebos to others. Because you're right, we don't show uh, Mateo, Mateos. Mateos, yeah. We don't show Mateos in the episode, but he was there and man, the kids <clears throat> believed him so much more than the adults. Mm -hmm. If he said, yeah, I get in there like every day, or whatever his schedule was, he, he was honest about all of this and he was honest about the good results he was getting. Although let's be very clear, this MRI is just a piece of plastic. It is not plugged in. It does not have the liquid helium and the magnets and anything. It's just plastic. And Mateus, at the time he participated in the study, was still blind to the condition meaning that he was still somewhat convinced that there was something to the machine, even though, even though he understood the language, he understood the concept of suggestion, but there's a part of him that didn't want to think about that fully. Mm -hmm. How can this only be a suggestion mm -hmm. if I'm in the basement of a neuroscience lab with this big machine? Clearly, they're lying when they tell me the truth that this is a placebo. <laughs> All right, let's get back into it. You guys ready? Mm -hmm. Here we go. In six weeks, we would return to the lab to check in on their progress. This high-tech contraption is pretty much what McGill University's first sham brain scanner looked like. It was an old, discarded hair dryer. But the patients didn't know that. In the original study, 56 undergraduate students were told that it was able to reduce pain, cause amnesia, influence sexual attraction, and produce various other impressive effects. The lab's new, more modern sham brain scanner shows even more promise and I was invited to participate in its test on a whole new group of adult subjects. Okay, so you can come in here and, and just okay. grab a seat. Yes. Uh, These college students are fully aware of what's possible today with neuroscience. 
Could even they be neuroenchanted enough to believe in the impossible? That an MRI scanner could read their thoughts? And we're looking at cutting edge psychological research. Okay. Yes. It's part of the Neural Activation Mapping Project. Mm -hmm. We're going to be putting you in an MRI. So it's a modified one. It's called the CTMS fMRI. Okay. So combined transcranial magnetic stimulation, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a big word just meaning it can both read and influence thoughts. All right. <laughs> okay. So you'll be choosing a number from 10 to 99. Okay. And then from looking at your uh, neural activation patterns, uh, Dr. Vessier here will try to infer which number you're thinking of. Hmm, interesting. So, okay. Okay, great. Most adults know the basics about MRIs, so we made sure to cover every detail. In this scanner, the magnetism is a lot less. Okay. And it's good for the documentary team because it means they can bring yeah. cameras. So that said, we do have to remove the metal. Got that it. Is. All this. After this realistic but completely unnecessary step, it was time to begin our fake mind reading experiment. So we're going to start the calibration. So try to stay very still. And I'll of course, there was actually nothing to calibrate, but we were conditioning our subjects with the expected procedures, sights, and sounds of a real MRI study. Okay, think of the number one. The subjects were asked to concentrate on the numbers zero to nine, while the machine supposedly mapped parts of their brains. Think of the number nine. Dr. Vessier and I remained in character at all times, pretending to analyze the subject's brain activity. But the images on our screens were actually old MRI scans from former patients. Is the calibration good? It looks pretty good to me. With our subject now primed, it was time to convince her that the scanner could identify a number she was thinking of by reading her mind. You're going to choose a number from 10 to 99. Okay. You're going to hear a beep, then mm -hmm. you'll hear a second beep. So you're always making the, your decision between the two beeps. Okay. Okay? Got it. So I'll slide you in. <laughs> so hold on to that number for just a second. Okay. Um, they're going to print it out and then we'll see. Okay. It was pretty clear. We pretended to give Jay the results of the MRI's analysis, but actually Jay was about to add the subject's number to the document with a little sleight of hand. Okay, so you can stay lying down just for a second. What was the number? 31. 31. Uh, okay, cool. So if you can sit up here. What? <laughs> so it's pretty close, but it's swapped, huh? Yeah. Okay. So that miss was actually intentional, so the results didn't appear to be perfect adding to the realism. So um, you're doing well. We'll do, we'll do another trial of this, the okay. same thing. Okay, I'll okay. slide you in. Michelle thought of a new number. Would the scanner get it right this time? Super clear. It's clear. Really good clear. this time. All right, they think the signal is clear. What okay. was your number? 27. Uh, 27, did you say? 27. Oh, okay, great, yeah. So if you can sit up here. Yes, oh wow, what? I don't understand. Crazy. So you chose 27. Did. And the technician thought 27 yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. How does that feel? Um, I didn't expect it to be so specific. Yeah. Um, a lot of different areas in the brain could be lighting up just to think of the concept of a number. What do you know? It worked. Thanks to the wonders of science, or rather, the skills of Jay, who in addition to being a neuroscientist, happens to be a professional magician on the side. While Jay won't reveal the secret of the trick, the mind-reading illusion is very similar to the mentalist tricks that have entertained audiences for over a century. The only difference is that when audiences see the stunt performed in a magic setting, they think it's a great trick not real science. The machine had 89. <laughs> That's cool. However, in the impressive scientific setting of the RAS lab, these subjects thought our magic trick was real science. Oh my god. <laughs> they didn't realize that the real science they were experiencing It's pretty cool. was the power of suggestion. Oh, wow. A dose of neuroenchantment this powerful can make for a formidable and effective placebo. I want to talk about the, the, the physical sensations. Sure. What was your experience? It felt like a headache was coming on. It mm. sort of felt like uh, like tingling through my head. Uh, where? Uh, just through this area. Like, this okay. whole area felt more like full. I felt like a sort of uh, a 
pressure or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, yeah. a strange feeling. So this like back here a little bit. In, in the back? Yeah, a little bit in the back. Somewhere in the back of the head, right? Yeah. Interesting. Some tingling, some tingling inside my head. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I want to hear what it felt like to have your mind read. That was very strange. I think I was probably skeptical, like, going into it, and then I couldn't figure out, as I was thinking, like, why, how that would happen otherwise, and so I'm just, I think, in a baffled state. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was time to clear up this baffling mystery. So, <clears throat> some deception has been going on today. Dr. Olson is uh, not reading your mind. Neither is this machine. This machine is deactivated. Oh, okay. All the noises were coming from a speaker. It was yeah. an illusion. Oh my God. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Dr. Olson is uh, not reading your mind. No. The sounds you're hearing are not magnets. It's just from a speaker. The machine in there is actually deactivated. It's not working. Wow, it's like placebo. Yeah, so that's exactly what it is. Now imagine tapping into this power for other effects, mm -hmm. like healing, for example. Right. Wow. I definitely believe the placebo effect is alive and well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we just saw adults being fooled and certainly lied to. Uh, however, uh, the cool thing is that while we punked the adults, we used that same phenomenon for good with the children. Um, and we, are, we don't deceive the children. We just allow them to, to deceive themselves. Um, I still don't know how the magic trick is done. And I never asked because it's his trick, not, not mine to know. But uh, when the participant said the number they were thinking of, he managed to somehow get it written on that sheet in the time it took him to be like, yep, that's what it said. And it was phenomenal. And then to hear people say, oh yeah, no, I felt tingling, my head felt full. It's like, you were just laying on a bed. Nothing was on, nothing was happening. It's all in your imagination. Well, a little behind the scenes here, you might remember that there was a second condition to that experiment where we implanted numbers in people's heads. So once, you know, we get them to believe that the ma machine reads their mind, so their minds are blown, and then we inserted numbers in their head. Um, so one of the guys you might remember said, you know, I thought of the number 45. I hate the number 45. I would never myself have picked that number. The number was just flying into my face. And so it's in that second condition that a lot of them reported, you know, kind of weird feelings feelings like tingling and, and headaches. That's right, I yeah. totally forgot. It didn't even make it into the episode. But we also said, now that we can read your mind, we are going to implant thoughts into your mind. You are going to have a number put into your head. You'll close your eyes and a number will appear that we have put there. And of course, we use the same sleight of hand trick to convince them that that's what happened. Whatever they thought they had, um, whatever they had thought was what we wanted them to think. And Obviously, that's crazy. Like, that could be abused so much. But yet we convinced neuroscience postdocs that we were able to do it. And you might remember we were toying around with doing, like just improvising a third condition where we make people speak or like say things or we induce the symptoms of Tourette's. And in retrospect, if we had done that, say in the behavior, uh, in the reverse exorcism episode, remember like, we were able to induce all kinds of weird feelings, like even an out-of-body experience, but we couldn't really get people to speak. We couldn't get the, the spirit to speak uh, through their mouth. But if we had taken them through like two steps like this to really convince them that this machine is doing something, then we could have gotten participants to do all kinds of wild things. Yeah, that, we did, ran out of time, but I remember that day yeah. you were like, let's just go out on the street, recruit yeah. people to come in. I can get them to say bad words and yeah, think that for it's, sure. it's being like, like they're a puppet of the machine. Is that related to hypnosis? Yeah, sure. yeah, of course. Absolutely, it, it is hypnosis. It's yeah. accessory ritual assisted hypnosis. Mm. I think that hypnotism is often seen, well, at least I can speak for myself, as a nothing but a trick, right? I know that there are cases where it's used clinically. Is it all placebo though? I mean, you're not, what are you really doing when you hypnotize someone? And they need to be susceptible to it. Have you ever been hypnotized? Uh, no, I think I could respond to being hypnotized like this because while I don't have a lot of faith in, ooh, hocus pocus, uh, hypnoti <laughs> hypnotizey, instead I will be like, this is an MRI, you're wearing a lab coat, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. Yeah, so is hypnosis like placebo? That depends what you mean by placebo. But uh, if what you're asking is, uh, is hypnosis tapping into some, say, 
uh, autonomic resources that we typically don't have access to volitionally, effortfully, then yes. So getting people to somehow relax their hypervigilance and being, being able to tap into uh, or elicit physiological responses that they themselves could not induce voluntarily, yes. And I think you're correct. Uh, the ritual of the induction ritual of you know surrendering to a set of suggestions about falling into trance, that's a kind of a culture-bound ritual that works into for some people, uh, that may not work for others, but uh, I think that anyone can be hypnotized as long as you find the right set of what we would call epistemic cues. So you tap into the, the kind of knowledge, the kinds of things that they're likely to believe in as being authoritative, then you can definitely get people to relax their critical thinking. and. So I'll say, I've actually been hypnotized before, mm. and I was very, very skeptical going in. And as the hypnotist was telling me, like, oh, when you open your eyes, you're going to forget the number three. I remember thinking to myself consciously, like, there's no way mm -hmm. I'm going to fall for this. And then he'd say, okay, now count to ten. And then I would get to three, and then I would, like, pause. Even though I'm telling myself, like, in my head, I'm saying, like, I can say the number three, but I just couldn't get it out. Wow. I need to do this. I need to get hypnotized because I've always seen it as just a party trick where I'm going to make you bark like a dog on stage for at a kid's birthday party and they do and I'm like, ah, they're all faking it. But, but you may not be susceptible. So there's, from what I've read, there's like a pretty Gaussian distribution of huh. susceptibility. So most people will fall for some things, but not all. Right. Some people will fall for nothing. Some fall for all. Exactly, sure. yeah. yeah. So it's interesting because it is a relatively stable psychological trait and that's well studied. Um, it doesn't change much throughout the lifetime except in childhood. So between the ages of seven and 14 is when people are more hypnotizable. Mm -hmm. And some people are, so we, we say they're highs or lows, high hypnotizables, low hypnotizables. And there is a normal distribution. Mm -hmm. But it's really weird. Actually, I don't know if I'd recommend it. It was a, kind of an unpleasant experience to be hypnotized. I've done more unpleasant things. I think That's I want to talk about that after this episode, <laughs> kind of talk through some of the more uncomfortable and scary moments. But for now, let's just get right back into the episode, all right? Yep. Here we go. There's evidence that the power of suggestion even works on animals. A study at North Carolina State University found that 86% of dogs receiving real seizure medication had a reduction in seizures, but almost as many, a full 79%, experienced the same effect from just a placebo pill. Now, we don't know how a placebo affects a dog's brain, but it could be that dogs have learned to associate vet visits and medicine from humans with feeling better. So giving them a placebo could help a dog's brain heal itself. Quick note, we recorded the scene with that dog so many times. Did there you? were so many takes. Were you there, Daniel? I was there. Oh, man. First of all, <laughs> I don't think a lot of people don't know this, but all those rooftop scenes from season one and two were shot at night. We did a whole week of overnight shoots from five in the evening to five in the morning. And so I don't know what time of night that was, but we're it's all like three exhausted. In the, morning. the dog would climb up to you. The dog would jump on me. Yeah, it was hard to get the dog to wait. And the trainer was like, look, the dog doesn't understand its cue. It just knows that you're gonna give him cheese. Yeah. And he doesn't know what you're saying. He doesn't know when it's a good moment. The dog was not a great actor. <sighs> Shall we continue? Here we go. So first I'll ask you to lie down again. And of course, you're a total pro at this. For several weeks, the children had undergone sessions in the sham scanner at McGill University. Your body continues to relax as we keep unleashing this healing energy. Each time, they were reminded that through concentration and relaxation, they were helping heal their own brains. Here we go. Finally, after six weeks of receiving the placebo sessions, it was time to get a report on the results. Malaya suffered from anxiety and a compulsive skin picking disorder. Had she experienced any level of success? It's good to see you. Good to see you. To, you go ahead and take a seat. You're wearing, like, not even, I thought maybe to have short sleeves on. You've just got a tank top on. <laughs> your arms look fantastic. They've really gotten better. And your face, I mean, all of it. Why do you think you're, you're better? I'm guessing it's the machine. Yeah, what about it? Uh... I'm not really sure how it works, but uh, I'm picking a lot less. Sometimes if I see like a tiny flake, I'll just leave it there. That's a pretty short amount of time for such a big change in the way you think and behave. 
That's awesome. I don't really feel the urge to do it as much as I did before. So it's a big improvement, I guess. Yeah, that definitely feels like and sounds like your brain being powerful. It's obviously doing something because my arms are better. Well, you seem a lot more confident holding your head up higher. Would you agree, Anne-Marie? Yes. <laughs> she seems less anxious. Mm. She's more positive overall. I was hoping for this. It's wonderful more to than see. Nice to see her that way. Yeah. <laughs> Good work. And as for Nicholas and his migraine headaches. Hey. Hi. It's good to see you again, Nicholas. Tell me about the procedure and how you felt afterwards. It accomplished all the things that I wanted it to. And I haven't had a migraine at all. That's awesome. And concentration is a big thing that helped. Wow. And can I see the symptom charts? For sure. So these go back to February. Yeah, well, they're really telling. And you can see, not good, lots going on, yeah. but then recently, no migraines at all. That's incredible. Yeah. So now you said you went to the neurologist? They thought it was quite remarkable. He hasn't needed any uh, rescue medication, and he hasn't needed the preventer, um, and he's not having migraines. I'm actually really excited for high school. Both Malaya and Nicholas attribute their improvements to the sham scanner. They believed it was working for them, and indeed it did. So how did Nathan, who suffered from ADHD and impulse control disorder, fare over the last six weeks? Well, I received a home video from Nathan's mother with an update on his progress. So um, the best part about going through the treatment was um, just what it did to our son. We noticed a difference in Nathan immediately after the first session. And do you remember what happened? I slept. Yeah, he slept, something he <laughs> doesn't do very often during the day. He slept for two hours. Um, he was refreshed. It was just incredible to see. And then what happened was the entire summer we had him off the medicine and he did great. He thought about stuff before he did it. We were able to talk things out and uh, it's been fun. So overall, we're very pleased and you know, we just, we had such a great experience. So thank you very much. The children's results are encouraging and a powerful sign of how effective suggestions and our willingness to believe them can be. In time, the kids will understand how all of the power was within them and not in the scanner. This work is truly cutting edge. It hasn't been done before. Correct. We also think of this as a great new way to do science and to collaborate. So much more of the public will see what's being done. Yes, science isn't just about publishing a paper that nobody reads. It's about spreading the ideas that you find. 100%. As far as I'm concerned, you're already a co-author in our scientific experimental paper. Wow, very cool. Thank you. The children's improvements were caused by the placebo effect and no deception was used to mask that. The parents knew the machine was deactivated, and the children were only told that it had the power to put a suggestion in their brain, a suggestion that ultimately came from themselves. But surely, the more people learn about placebos and their lack of intrinsic power, the less effective they'll be, right? No. Studies show that even when subjects learn that their treatment was a placebo, the positive results do not go away. What the subjects have learned about how to heal themselves remains with them. It was an honor to have been a part of this study. I think this is Mindfield at its best, using our resources to help researchers with their work and helping the public see how the brain is studied. Placebos can't fix everything, but these kids always had the power to start healing. All they needed was the power of suggestion. And as always, thanks for watching. All right, so that's the episode. Dr. Vessier, I have dismissed Elizabeth and Daniel so that we can talk one-on-one, -on -one, honestly. I miss them. Do you feel the pressure? What are your, what are your thoughts now, two years after that episode? Well, my thoughts are where, where to take this further, and, and so I'm thinking in lots of directions. Uh, one of them is practical. It's kind of unfortunate that the general public is really interested in this, um, but it's still 
hard to convince the scientific community and the clinical community that there's something per, uh, worth pursuing there because it's so weird. So it's been difficult to get research funding. It's been difficult to get our research papers accepted for publication when we you know, try to present this particular project. How do you do a control in a study on the effectiveness of placebo? Like, do you test it against a different placebo? Yeah, and that's been one of the comments from reviewers when we try to submit this uh, from publications, and I think it was a really good comment. They're asking, okay, so it seems you're doing this really cool, really amazing procedure. You're giving these kids a lot of attention, a lot of positive reinforcement, uh, but what exactly works and what doesn't work? Is there anything in that intervention that is absolutely necessary or essential? For example, do you actually need the scanner? Could you just go and you know give kids lots of positive suggestions about how they can use their... Uh, hyperactivity, to be really focused and strong, or could you use just a watch? So I can tell you something we're doing right now is uh, we're beginning to test in a randomized trial uh, just a watch versus just a machine to see if one of them works better. Huh. Okay, That's that, that sounds really nice and like precise. But precise or not, because even then there's so many other factors as you know, so say the charisma or the reassuring tone of the experimenter. Like, I'm sure you're interested in the replication crisis yeah. in psychology, right? Oh, so yeah. one of the hypotheses is also that, well, it could be that some labs are trying to replicate a study uh, well, the experimenters are just not as charismatic. They're just right. not as good or not as authoritative. And there's lots of other factors that are going on. And it's not just the mechanism itself that doesn't work. Is that this one team is not able to reproduce it. Man, it's so hard to control for all of those things. A bunch of different people need to run this, but they all have to have the exact same charisma. <laughs> <laughs> and every day, no matter what their mood is, different from day to day, it can't be. Because we really only want to look at watch versus machine. When we know that the charisma can play such a big role. Mm -hmm. Or also the setting of the study, you know, is it in the hospital or is it like right now we're gonna replicate it in a school? Uh, because well, it turned out that logistically, now that Minefield is not there to handle recruitment for us, then we just could not manage to bring all the participants in the hospital. And we have a contingent from a school, so it's a lot easier to do it there. And as such, we also have to use a simpler mock scanner. Right, you know what, that brings up a big limitation of how Minefield can help. Because if you said, okay, I've got a, a, a different experimental design that I, I think is gonna work really well, but it's very similar, could you do another episode that'll look almost exactly the same? I would love to, but I don't know if um, but, YouTube would pay for that. So, you know, I, I hope that Minefield can at least bring what's being done and its importance to the public so that they know what to support and they know what to, I don't know, what, what kind of good things are being done and why it's important for us to have research institutions that are investigating things that might seem, I don't know, a little still fuzzy, but yet can lead to amazing discoveries. What are you working on that I don't know about that might be interesting for future episodes of Minefield of Vsauce? I know that you were working with Tulpa Mansers. Mm -hmm. That's still going on, and if so, explain what that is. Sure, so before talking about Talpam answers, we're also doing lots of stuff related to suggestion and placebo studies. So we're testing, like say, fake Adderall, uh, fake psychedelics. Hmm. Uh, we're also- Oh, fake psychedelics. Fake psychedelics. There's an episode in the first season of Minefield where we give people a short-acting psychedelic, and we have Confederates in the room mm -hmm. that pretend like, whoa, everything's echoing. And sure enough, you can make people think they're tripping. Absolutely, and we also use Confederates, just like you guys, and we had really good results. So what are, what are you specifically, like, uh, what variables are you kind of tweaking and, and, and studying? Well, we're also interested in, in the whole battery of non-specific psychosocial effects beyond the chemical properties of the substance mm -hmm. themselves, including the particular cultural expectations that this psychedelic experience should yield these particular effects. Right. So we're looking at you know social proof, uh, you, you know social conformity, emotional contagion, but also you know testing you know particular cultural beliefs. We're also going to be testing um, sham genetic testing to see how convincing that might be. Ooh. And at some point, one of the, your dream is to compare that to uh, sham uh, neuroscience, so to see you know, different kinds of neuroenchantment. So we're doing- And then what's the point? Okay, so we learn that people are neuroenchanted and they're, I don't know, DNA enchanted. What's the word for that? Our, our, our faith in genetic research. 
we think there are really big ethical implications, particularly when we start thinking about potential nocebo effects and culturally widespread nocebo effects. So genetic testing also generates a lot of anxiety. A lot of the times it's not done under proper you know, clinical settings and clinical guidance and people start worrying immensely because they have a particular gene that is thought to correlate with a particular condition like say Alzheimer's for example. And that can bring about all kinds of negative experiences including sometimes perhaps precipitating early onset of diseases that may not otherwise uh, have been triggered. So we think there's lots of important implications, particularly in terms of you know, debunking dangerous pseudomedical and pseudoscientific ideas. So if we're able to demonstrate that uh, there's a lot of authority, a lot of placebo and nocebo effects associated with, say, genetic testing, then we're better able to inform clinical practice, for example, or policy. And the public to not be quite so enchanted by it for and sure. perhaps misled. For sure. Needlessly panicked. Wow, it's important stuff. And, and so to answer your questions, yes, we're, we're still working with Talpam answers. Uh, as you recalled, I did a cyber ethnography years ago with just a little bit of psychological testing on these really cool, um, weird young people who, imagine, who conjure imaginary friends that they come to experience as basically as uh, auditory visual hallucinations, except they're not crazy and they report um, an increase in well-being in their life, even in social adjustment as a result of having picked up the practice. So people want to say, well, they're crazy, they're hearing voices, and we think we're able to show that no. In fact, there's lots of contexts in which you can hear voices and be uh, a very healthy person. So now, uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Michael Lifshitz and uh, Dr. Tanya Lerman at Stanford University, we're in the process of doing neuroimaging of tulpamancers and mm. comparing them also to evangelical Christians who speak in tongue. Right. And so we're interested in seeing what happens in the brain when uh, either uh, a spirit or a tulpa sort of takes over and starts talking. And we, we're, uh, we're interested in the, uh, in the motor, area, mo motor areas of the brain as well. And we want to see if something different is going on when, say, an agency other than a self, a tulpa or a spirit is sort of in control. Yeah, what does it look like in the brain when you aren't in control of your thoughts and behavior? Like, right. If we can tease out the difference, then are we literally finding like that is your agency, that is your consciousness, your will. Mm -hmm. And if it's gone, then you feel like you're possessed. Yeah. Which, by the way, brings us to our reverse exorcism episode, oh, yeah. which yeah. you guys should all check out. Keep me up to date on what you're doing because I, uh, I really want to help in any way that I can and, uh, you know, communicate all the cool work that you're doing. So, Dr. Messier, thank it's you. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now we're going to turn to a darker topic, my own death. Should I die? Let's find out. Someday, I will die. But should I? If I was offered a longer life, I would take that in a second. But how long is too long? Is death something I should deny forever? Or is death and the role it plays in the universe, something I am better off accepting. I want to start by looking at a particular way death affects how we live and treat one another. Hmm. Terror management theory proposes that people like you and me manage the terror of death's inevitability by embracing cultural values. That the more aware a person is of their own mortality, the more vehemently they will enforce their particular views of the world onto others. Created by social psychologists Sheldon Solomon, Jeff Greenberg, and Tom Szynski, Terror Management Theory, or TMT, suggests that often we are afraid of change because we're afraid of death. Each one of us has a worldview, a set of beliefs, customs, and norms we identify with that can live on after our physical bodies die. TMT suggests that rises in nationalism and prejudice are correlated with rises in the salience of mortality, 
that is how present the inevitability of death is in people's minds. Now this role that death plays fascinates me and two of TMT's originators, Jeff and Sheldon, have agreed to work with me on a pilot study of terror management theory and real life reminders of death. What's your hypothesis today? Well, I think we're gonna hope for the um, participants who are reminded of their mortality to be more punitive yeah. in their assessments. We'll see what happens. For our study, we created a fake research center staffed by actors and invited participants to be a part of what they were told was a focus group about the criminal justice system. During the actual study, each group will hear a list of several different crimes that have been committed and will then be asked to propose a punishment for each offender with a severity level ranging from one to seven, with one being the most lenient and seven being the most severe. The control group will simply enter the survey room and be asked to answer the questions. The experimental group, however, will first be exposed to reminders of their own mortality with strategically placed posters in the lobby. Also, the questionnaires they fill out will include questions about their own death. Decades of TMT research have shown that when presented with violations of common worldviews, those who are more aware of their own deaths will recommend bigger punishments for the crimes presented. But will our real-life reminders of death, not just the survey questions usually used, make a difference? Well, first, let's look at the control participants. Well, thank you so much for being here. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough. There are no right or wrong answers. This is just about your gut-level reactions. All right, let's begin. After raising millions of dollars in grant money to fund education for needy children, a fundraising manager unhappy with this life fled with all the money and was arrested months later in Tasmania where he was living under a different name. So one, least punishment, three months in prison, seven, most severe, 10 years in prison. Please answer now. This That's is one that I think does have a potential world views on both sides. Yeah. That is a lot of sevens. If our control group is already maxing out like that, well then our scale has no room in that direction to show any effect of mortality salience. Discovering issues like this, learning how to better isolate mortality salience's effect, is exactly what a pilot test is for. Hey, hey. personal differences, huh? Yeah. An imposter with no medical training posed as a surgeon and bungled a minor operation to remove a child's tonsils. The patient recovered fully after additional treatment. One is six months on probation, seven is 10 years in prison. Okay. If you are taking on the persona of a doctor, we will expect good behavior. The surgeon botched the operation and was found to be under the influence of narcotics, causing her to have permanent hoarseness and ruining her career. A 16-year-old girl who had just received her license drove through a red light, hitting another car that was being driven by a talented pianist. A couple was taking their two children to the playground when they saw a woman sunbathing nude. Look at that. <laughs> there could be a gender gap. We're also learning a lot about the worldviews people have. Yeah, absolutely. An anti-government protester was arrested for spray painting profanities at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. One, 40 hours wow, she went service. one yeah. right Seven, away. Five years in prison. She's not a fan of authority five. and rules. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Thank we really you. appreciate it. All right, so here's the, the results and the mathematical analysis. These are averages per question, these are the averages and, and medians per participant. Right. The fours are, are great, the three is great. Uh, but this is grounds for optimism, at least. Seven was the max sentencing value, and our control group gave an average of 4.5. I'm really happy with that as a, as a control group. Absolutely. Now, our experimental groups. Remember, they will be seeing posters that remind them of their own mortality and will be asked different questions in their questionnaire. For example, please describe the emotions that the thought of your own death arouses in you. And write down as specifically as you can what you think will happen to you physically as you die. 
The point is to prime their mortality salience. Let's see if this group is more punitive towards worldview violations. After raising millions of dollars to fund education for needy children, a fundraising manager fled with all the money and was arrested months later in Tasmania. One, three months in prison. Seven, 10 years in prison. Please answer now. He's thinking about it. Please hold up your answers. All right, thank you so much. Ah, okay. An imposter with no medical training posed as a surgeon and bungled a minor operation to remove a child's tonsils. One, six months on probation. Seven, 10 years in prison. They are thinking a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> a 10. I'm pretty sure she knows that seven we'll is the highest. Yeah, we'll yeah. call it a seven. Yeah. It's funny to see when people feel bold enough, even though I'm like breaking the, the, the bounds and the yeah. rules of the task. An anti-government protester was arrested for spray painting profanities at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. I really do appreciate the way they clearly seem to be taking a bit more time to deliberate. Yeah. OK, they can put the papers down and tell them that we will be in shortly. OK, thank you so much. We've finished with this part of the study, so if you won't mind just hanging out for a moment. And our researchers will be in here in a moment to ask you a couple questions. Let's find out if the reminders of mortality we showed our experimental group were salient enough. Let me ask you about one thing uh, out in the waiting room. Uh, did you all notice the posters at all? Yes, yes. they are all death related. OK. Yes. All right. I was surprised as soon as I walked in the door and I saw the graves to them. So yeah. Ah. Uh, <laughs> right, that's into? right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we are looking into something that's called terror management theory. And it's the idea that your own awareness of your mortality can affect the behaviors that you exhibit. That we all manage the terror we, that we feel knowing that we are mortal by behaving in certain ways, especially in ways that reinforce our own worldviews. Because we can kind of live on through the societies and cultures and identities that we have today. Did any of you feel like you were still thinking a little bit about death when you were came in here? Or? I was definitely going after people who transgressed against my worldview, to use your term. And yes, I noticed that. Yes, I was definitely doing that. So this was incredibly helpful. Yeah. Thank you very much for your participation. Yeah, thank you. So thank much. you. I appreciate it. It looks like our experimental stimuli were successful. They were salient, but they didn't cause the participants to think they were related to the study. The control participants averaged about 4.5. The experimental participants were close to 4.7. So there's a slight tendency for the experimental people to be leaning in the direction that we predicted. But we're talking about relatively inconsequential differences. That's right. Uh, it just but, makes me hungry to run more people. Right. And with the number that we had, that's statistically insignificant. Do you think that we did see any effects of mortality salience today? I feel like the mortality salient groups tended to take a little longer yeah. before responding. Yeah, me too. And they seemed more thoughtful. Yeah, they, they really... They seemed to put more effort yeah. into it, into trying to do the right thing. The difference was dramatic enough that we picked up on it. Absolutely. Although our stimuli might need to go through a couple more passes and some more vetting, we did find an interesting difference in the time it took for our groups to respond. Our control group took an average of 4 minutes and 46 seconds to decide on their punishments, but our experimental group took an average of 7 minutes, 18 seconds. In a sense, that really is the prediction. The right thing by their own worldview, but by the same token, when we think about death, we want to do what's right. And if, yeah. we're, if we're acting like jurors, we want to make the right decisions. As we very much learned today, the goal isn't to prove one thing one way or the other, it's just to reduce uncertainty. That's correct. In the most careful way possible. Absolutely, to know a little bit more today than we did yesterday. Yeah. Ooh, okay, we have a lot to talk about. And luckily, I've got just the person here with me to talk about all of this with, 
Judy Ho, a clinical neuropsychologist, tenured professor at Pepperdine. You run your own practice. You work with ethics a lot. What is your actual position? So I'm the chair of the Institutional Review Board at Pepperdine University. At Pepperdine. Which is how we first started working together because you were doing the trolley experiment and that was an interesting thing to talk about. Yes, if you have seen the trolley problem episode of Minefield, you have seen Judy there helping us with the ethics of can we make people think they've committed murder? Is that mm -hmm. okay? Maybe it's not okay for a university to do, but can a TV show do it? Bottom line is we learned a lot. And so, Judy, I wanted you here today to talk with me about running experiments on people, mm -hmm. okay? But also running experiments on people for a TV show. Mm -hmm. Because there are all kinds of limitations and issues that come up. And I think that what we just saw is a great example of all the different things that happen that are both good and bad, challenges and opportunities for Minefield when it comes to psychological experiments. For sure. So the biggest problem we have is it's not possible for us to run enormous numbers of participants. Right. We have a very tight schedule and we have a whole crew working with us. We cannot run hundreds or thousands of people. We can run like a couple dozen. Right. And sometimes that's not enough to really get a statistically significant result. Right. Also, I think it's very clear here, um, the kinds of participants who come onto the show. Mm -hmm. They don't even know they're on a TV show, by the way, until the end when we debrief them. But ah. the kinds of people who are available um, here in LA, mm -hmm. in the middle of the day, right. is a both a very narrow and a very wide group of people. Right. If we were running this at a university and we needed people to be free in the middle of the day, we would get a very homogenous group. Yeah. They would be predominantly young people between mm -hmm. like 19 and 22, their worldviews would be pretty similar. I mean, they're all at the same institution. They're yes. probably socioeconomically pretty well off because they're at this university. Their um, um, cultural backgrounds might be much more similar than what we find working in TV, where we might get retired people and immigrants and really young people and actors, mm -hmm. a lot of actors. Right, yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the number of people in LA who are free to do studies in the middle of the day oh who are goodness. also part-time actors mm -hmm. is huge, mm -hmm. which then always leads to the issue of the audience at home goes, wait a second, and they Google up something and they go, that person was on a TV show right. once. Is this <laughs> all just yesterday. fake? And it's like, yeah. that's what it's like to see who, to just grab who's available in LA. Right. right. But because of the diversity that we get, um, I think our populations represent the country better, mm -hmm. but also we have way more noise. Yes. Questions about how bad is it to deface an American monument mm -hmm. are going to have very different answers yes. from different people. Absolutely. And in this particular study, we had that problem. We're mm -hmm. trying to see if you'll enforce your worldview more or less if you're reminded that you're going to die someday. Right. And the issue was that everyone showing up had very different worldviews. Yes. All right, so I've just thrown a whole bunch of stuff at you. A lot you. of stuff to talk about. Well, We're, first of all, I thought it was fascinating the way that it was set up. And it was a really, really good episode to watch. And, and just to see the reactions of the proponents of the theory, that was so cool that you got them to be in it. I know. Because they're invested in the theory, they're, you know? That was so <laughs> cool. And both yeah. of them wrote all of those scenarios. Yes. And it was truly science in action. Mm -hmm. They came up with scenarios, we found out, wow, some of these are just so extreme, even to a control group, that we don't see any room for any other variables to change right. in that direction. Right. So we had to rewrite them um, in between days, and gosh, it was, it was true science. Yeah, no, it was really cool to see it in action, and it was really cool to see how different the control group and the experimental group was in terms of the latency and even their facial responses as they were considering all of this. I certainly saw that being a significant effect, that they just seemed like they were taking their roles so much more seriously, right? Whereas sometimes when you get these people to come in for an experimental study, they're just here for their whatever, $10 or whatever you're offering them for their time. And you know, they're more haphazard about it. And I certainly saw that with that second group, there was just this real pronounced sense of gravity to their considerations. 
yeah, we thought, you know what, the severity of punishment dealt out, that will be the, the, the variable that will change based on mortality salience. Mm -hmm. But it turned out to be disposition and thoughtfulness. Totally. Luckily, we recorded the whole thing. So we could go back and say, how long did they take? Yes. That wasn't originally measured, but because yes. of the footage, we could time. Mm -hmm. And we found out that it took almost twice as long for the mm -hmm. group that came in thinking, I've just written an essay about what I think death will be like. Right. Punishing people right. for violating cultural norms. This is a heavy thing too. And they yeah. reacted differently. Yeah. And I think that it may not be. I mean, I understand the original tenets of terror management theory, but I can also imagine when somebody is really really very cognizant of their mortality, that they might actually be more lenient. Like, life is short. I want this person to have a second chance. And so I think part of what wasn't measured that might have been helpful is actually trying to counterbalance the two groups in terms of do you have the same types of belief systems and ideologies, right? Because if we don't have that, then they're kind of just going at their own values. And if we don't know very much about it, you can see why that noise could contribute to the average being 4.5 and 4.7 in the two groups. <laughs> exactly. Which is is yeah. basically no difference at all. Right, yeah. Um, but yes, I think in hindsight, and this is again, the whole point of science is to be like, all right, what can we learn and how can we keep at all times the uncertainty on this track down and down and down? Yeah. And right, if we kind of knew what people's worldviews were ahead of time, like if we had interviewed them a couple of weeks before, mm -hmm. long enough ago that they don't remember it anymore, right. right? Make them somehow not think that it matters too much that the questions are related. You know, then the test I think could have given us better results in terms of the punishments dealt out and all of that. Um, and But it can be frustrating when you wanna do a show and you wanna show results and teach, but you also wanna experiment. Yes. And sometimes the experiment won't always leave you with everything nicely tied up. Right. And that's a good lesson to give people, but it has been frustrating to do experiments where you need a big population of people. It's easier on the minefield to make myself the guinea pig mm -hmm. or focus on a topic where we just need to see it happen one time. Right, like, right. Like, can I get someone to falsely confess to a crime? Mm -hmm. If I get one person to do it, then we're done. Right. But if I want to see a tendency for people to be more punitive to worldview, of their worldview violations, mm -hmm. if they're reminded of death, I really need to run hundreds of people. So, yeah. I mean, what do you what do you think? Is there? Should, do we need to remind the audience of that every time? You know, honestly, I don't think so. And, and I would say, first of all, that social psychology experiments especially are built on the backbone of very homogenous populations. It's tended, it's tended to always involve undergraduate students who are given the option of either doing this 10-minute experiment or writing a 15-page paper. It's not really yeah. very ethical, actually, because you're kind of coercing them towards the experiment. And so you're going to get lots of first and second year psychology students. and. Again, it's still for a class, so how honest are they really being? Because what if the professor s discovers what their answers are? And so there's all kinds of things that are already inherently an issue in even the published studies in social psychology. And I think what a TV experiment really does that I don't think any more kind of, you know, planned out research study with hundreds and thousands of participants will do is a really lively and visual demonstration. And that in itself is really useful because if somebody actually says, now I wanna take that study protocol and apply it to 500 people, they now have a template to Which do Which they that. should do, by the way. Yeah. Please do that. That would be, Minefield would have done its job. Um, but yeah, I think the responsibility I have with Minefield is to document how science is done mm -hmm. and what results might look like and what the protocols can be and then the comments wind up being full of people with different ideas, how they would have done it differently, and I'm like, perfect. Awesome, that people wanna weigh in and be so engaged. Exactly, go off yeah. and, and, and do that. You know, we, we really didn't know how that experiment would go. Mm -hmm. And I still don't know how it would go if you changed one little thing in one way or the other. Well, and I think it also shows the beauty of what an ad hoc analysis can do. Like uh, oftentimes you have your hypotheses, like for example, your hypothesis was that you would go in and you would see that there was gonna be more severity in terms of ratings of punishments in the experimental group, but actually you didn't see that. And then you thought, but something else was happening because we saw the videotape and oh, it's how long they took. And you were able to go back and call that data and to make a statement about that. And that difference was significant. It was almost double the amount of time that the experimental group, it was cool to see that. It was cool and you could 
feel a difference in the mood, which yes. it's hard to measure, but you know what? When you are recording everything from multiple angles, yeah. you have that evidence, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You have that documentation. They seem stressed. Like they I, when were I was stressed. watching, them, I felt bad for them. Like they just looked so upset, you know? They weren't they weren't fun scenarios. It's no, like, hey, this no. person botched a surgery because they lied about their qualifications, or yeah. this doctor got drunk and hurt someone. Yeah. There are pretty bad things to think about anyway. This really just brings up though, you know, kind of the spirit of why we do experiments in the first place, mm. because it's always a cost-benefit analysis. And I think we talked about this also on the trolley episode. You know, it's really about what kind of information you're getting. Are you just torturing people for fun and using your hidden cameras for fun? Or are you providing some kind of educational value or a way that people can process important issues like mortality? When I first saw you in the casket, I gotta tell you, that's one of my worst fears. We talked about this on the most recent episode I worked on with you, that that is my biggest fear is yeah. death. So that, you are providing some value and insight to people who are thinking about, how do I make the most of my time on this earth? And does it mean if I take my moral decisions a little bit more carefully that I'm gonna feel better about myself and my life at the end of the day? Because that could be providing some kind of insight for people to better their lives. Yeah, that's my favorite part of every experiment we run. The debriefing, where I get to say, so here's fun. what we're studying. And people, they don't, they've never gone, oh, okay, cool, can I get my money now? They're always right. like, well, they want the money. But also, of course. they're like, wow, oh yeah, because I was feeling this. And, mm -hmm. and they, they, they're excited to think about it on the car way, on the car home, and they're gonna tell their friends about it that night. And I hope it does a lot of good for them, even if sometimes they may have been a little bit scared halfway through. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that that is really the, the core of why the experiments are important on TV because there, you are gonna get a more engaged audience and if it encourages people to think about themselves and to encourage personal development, to tell their friends and family, then I think you've done a great job. So I don't think that you have to necessarily say, and by the way, maybe this experiment would turn out different if you had 500 people running it because the visual aspects of the experiment as it is built is what's triggering these people to really do that self-evaluation versus reading it on a page. I mean, that's part of the problem with experiments is that they're in these journals that you have to be a psychologist to subscribe or just a really interested mm -hmm. person who's not a psychologist, but you want to pay your $500 a, right, a so year. Right, you have to also be really rich because yeah. you're getting like a weekly thing and it's huge, oh my yeah. gosh, No one's gonna that. read that. So this is a great way for people to understand experiments and not feel afraid. You know, a lot of people will tell me, I'm afraid to run experiments. That seems like a lot of work to do. Well, the way that it was broken down in the episode, it doesn't really look like people can't do a version of it themselves sometimes, you know? It did take a lot of work. We have the best <laughs> you made, crew You made ever. it look easy. <laughs> yeah, we made it look easy. I uh, yeah. love to hear that. Um, I, I, I also think what we just saw is a good way to talk about hidden camera shows. Yeah. Because a common question I get is, how do the people not know they're on TV? How mm -hmm. do they not see the cameras? Mm -hmm. And they don't. <laughs> they don't. We do a really good job. It's I mean, exciting. we're in LA and I'm working with the best hidden camera people. I mean, I go into the room and I'm like, but aren't we gonna film this? And they're like, <laughs> We're filming it right now. From five the, cameras. <laughs> yeah, the ways they have the disguised cameras. I've always said we need to cover that on the show. Yeah. So that people know how the cam how well hidden the cameras were. Yeah, because they were excellent angles too. You know, you got I know, really but good. But guess what? The producers are like, no, because oh. then people will know the secrets. Oh, trade secrets. And they'll know what to look at. Oh, trade secrets, but also they don't want future participants to go, mm. you know what? If I see that pattern, there's probably a camera um. behind it. They, Wow. It works because people don't know how we're hiding them so well. Oh, yeah. If you look at the projector screen, you can see that there's a band across it of a different texture, and that is something that a camera can see through. Oh, okay. But in the room, you don't think anything of it. It's just this boring feature and no one notices. And then when we tell them they're on TV, uh -huh. they're all like, what? Right. So there's a whole <laughs> other permission form they have to sign after they learn that. Sure. Because we can't tell them beforehand or else they people will act different if they know that there's going to be an audience out yeah. there watching later. Yes, absolutely. And we see that a lot in social psychology mm. studies. I mean, even just the presence of more people in the room can already impact how they respond. So in this particular scenario, there was one experimenter. It feels less like an audience, but sometimes you'll have three or four experimenters and it does print it, print like really, uh, like in a big way affect how people start to deal with themselves, deal with each other. You can sometimes see them being more polite, a little bit more ginger with things. And it's only because they think that other people are watching and taking notes about them. You know what? 
This makes me want to bring up something else. We really need to get back into the episode. But like, come on, I can do whatever I want, right? <laughs> so, Minefield began as this idea I had for a show that at the time I called Prankology. Uh -huh. Because when I was a student in high school and college, psychology professors would often show candid camera clips mm -hmm. and then talk about the social psychology that was evident in those clips. The clips were entertaining. The science was cool. I'm like, let's do that. And pranks were kind of a thing because of punk. This was a mm -hmm. while back, right? Mm -hmm. But all of the pranks that like networks wanted to do essentially only taught one thing, fight or flight. They just right. wanted people right. to get really scared and freak out and pee yeah. their pants. Luckily, YouTube saw that there was value in something like this. We're like, so is anyone gonna scream? Is any, anyone gonna think their car was totaled? And I'm like, no, they're just gonna respond to a question with a number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but interestingly, you have to make that interesting. How do you have someone fill out a survey and have it be good visually? Right. Well, we came up with the idea of having them write their number and then show it to the proctor of the study so that the camera could see what number they wrote. That's right. the whole reason they did it that way rather than fill it in and turn the paper right. in. Which of course changes results too, because if it's a private opinion versus yes. one that they're showing They're showing, then their face is associated with it. Yeah. But last at the last minute, we had to put those blinders up so they couldn't see what other people next to them were doing because we knew that that would affect it. Yeah. So we had to walk the line of, okay, we want them to put the number up next to their face for the camera, mm -hmm. but we don't want that to affect how they answer the question. So how do we make sure that it still feels as private as possible? Right. A lot of thinking goes in a this. A lot of thinking, <laughs> a lot of thinking. And I also wonder too, just even the characteristics of the experimenter in the room, the actor that you guys hired. Again, with certain of those questions, there could also be a response of, well, this person might judge me if I rate this a seven, just based on their own perception of what that person would Exactly, be. that is something that is yeah. worth investigating more, experimenting with more. Um, what I can say is that during those trials, mm -hmm. the direction we gave Trent, who's our wonderful actress, she's just perfect at that, this kind of role and many mm -hmm. others, but we told her, you have to kind of act bored. <laughs> like you've yeah. been doing this all day uh -huh. and you don't, you don't care, care what they write down. Yeah, that no way gasp they'll just be, of surprise. Yeah, you're not gonna be like, oh, you gave it a one. Yeah. <laughs> also, she just read a script. She read nice. each word off a page so it was always the same language Perfect. and it was just monotone, mm -hmm. which is a funny direction to give someone who is in a, like a really talented actress to be right. like, we need you to- As boring as possible. Be as boring as possible <laughs> and as least acting as possible. Right, right. <laughs> as little acting as possible. Yeah. Um, Judy, thank you so much. Thank you. Always so fun. a pleasure. Awesome. All right, we're gonna continue watching this episode. When we come back, I will have a new guest, but not new to you or me, so actually not a new guest at all. I'll have a different guest. Let's get ready to learn more about whether Michael should die. Our pilot test shows that there's still a lot to discover about terror management and many promising ways to do it. I'm particularly intrigued by our observation that for all the closed-mindedness mortality salience appears to cause, it also led to what looked like increased consideration and thought. I'd love to see more research on that idea. But the point is this. If death's effects aren't all entirely bad, what if instead of or at least at the same time that we hope for the abolition of natural death, we also find a way to accept it. Now, obviously, I don't want to die, at least not soon, but accepting the inevitability of my own death and being less afraid of it feels powerful and honest. I'd like to learn what that looks like, and I have a friend who can help. I'm paying a visit to Caitlin Doty, a mortician, author, and death positivity activist who has made an entire career out of discussing the aspects of death that most of us prefer to ignore. What do you say to someone who comes to you and says, I think death is terrifying. It's so scary and sad that I'm just here now. Is this person dying or is this person? This person is me in front of you this right now. This person is you, okay, yeah. so. <laughs> I would tell you a couple things. First, you're dealing with the primal existential quandary of human existence. Yes. And you are one of, 
you know, the many billions of people who have felt this. So you're not alone in feeling this way. Huh. So we go through life, we reach a certain age, and we begin to understand that someday ourselves and everyone we love will die. And that's powerful, painful knowledge. And I think from that moment, we have to start developing defense mechanisms to handle that and to integrate that into our lives. So what are those defense mechanisms? I think that the more obvious ones would be having a child, writing a book, making a TV show, creating a legacy of some kind. But there's also a more insidious version, which is war, hmm. taking other countries, being rich and being okay with other people being poor. I think those are all signs of death denial. They're all saying, mm. but I'm okay because I have this money or I have this power. Or I have these kind of dark impulses that allow me to say, at least I can outrun death in that way. And of course that's not true. No one can outrun death, but you can trick yourself into believing that. So how would you characterize the Western relationship to death? Take America. 150 years ago. If you were my husband and you died, I would be entirely in charge of you. I would wash your body. I would get the neighbor to make a wooden coffin for you. We would put you in the coffin and carry you on our shoulders to the grave, which someone had dug themselves. Right. It would have been an entirely self-sufficient process. But what happened around the turn of the 20th century is really three big things mm -hmm. in my mind. One, you had the rise of hospitals, so people were no longer dying at home. You had the rise of funeral homes, which means that we are now outsourcing our death. Third one is slaughterhouses. Ah. So all of a sudden, all food production and the killing of animals ah. is also hidden as well. And we live in our suburban houses where all those things are outsourced. And it's just these layers and layers and layers of denial around death. But what does it mean to accept death. I don't think that you ever truly accept death, but I believe that the movement toward accepting death involves really true self-awareness about where you're hiding your fears of death. That's where real awareness and acceptance can come from. For me, the, the thing that's just such a bummer about death is that I just, I'm done. I don't get to continue learning things and seeing what happens, and I'm just not part of Earth anymore. Isn't death kind of what gives you that passion when you think about it? When you think about like, I love learning, I love ideas. If you didn't have an end point, are you going to come in here today with all these cameras and do the huge amount of legwork that creating a show requires? No. No, right, because you're like, I don't know, maybe I'll do it 200 years from now. Whereas right now you're taking in information left and right because you want to produce content. You want to produce exciting things and share with other people. Because this is my one chance. This is your that. one chance. The passion and the realness to life comes from it ending. Hmm. That's the great <laughs> gift that death gives us. Yes. What's an unhealthy relationship to have to your own mortality? The pursuit of immortality and the pursuit of I will stay alive until I can upload my brain into the cloud, that, that worries me. The idea that everyone is just allowed to live forever from here on out is not environmentally sensible. It's not, you know, it, it's just not a sensible position to take. We are seeing the dawn of a new era of possibilities unfold on planet Earth. What will our amazing world be like in, say, 80, 100, or even 200 years from now? Wouldn't you like the possibility of finding out? To understand why some people feel like death shouldn't be inevitable, I've come to Alcor, one of the world's leading life extension facilities. Linda. Hi. Hi, how I'm are Michael. you? Great to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Welcome to Alcor. Thank you for having me here. I'm meeting Linda Chamberlain, who co-founded Alcor nearly 46 years ago. So this facility that we are in right now is where you both cryopreserve people and store them. Yes. We have 160 patients. Wow. And we have 1,190-something um, uh, members. It changes. So. And a member is someone who is alive today. Alive today. They've made the planning. arrangements for this. Once they are cryopreserved, they become patients. You're using the word patient. Yes. Okay. Tell me about why you use that word. For us, death is not something which is like an on-off switch. 
one second you're alive, the next second you're dead. Mm -hmm. What we are trying to do is to slow down and stop the dying process. To become a patient at Alcor, first you have to pay between eighty and two hundred thousand dollars. Then you have to die, or more specifically, be pronounced clinically dead. This generally means that your heart and lungs have stopped functioning. At that point, Alcor can begin their work. Now there are two ways that a person could sign up for this procedure: mm -hmm. either as a whole body patient or as a neuro. Oh, and does neuro just mean head? It means, yes, the cephalon, actually, which is all of the structures down to about the clavicle. Uh-huh. I'm a neuro. Everybody in my family who's now in stasis is a neuro. Really? Most of the people who really understand the technology are neuros. The primary reason that people choose whole body is emotional. Of course. And they're not comfortable with the idea of their body being removed and discarded. So let's say that our patient is whole body. The moment the patient is pronounced, they go into an ice bath, and this is just crushed ice, and it's water in mm -hmm. there as well. Their heart is started again with a mechanical thumper. They're intubated, and their lungs are functioning again, being ventilated, circulating the, the cooler temperatures. Yeah, 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 so you need the veins, the arteries, the vasculature, the right. heart, you need all of those all of continuing that. to pump and, and right. circulate. This is our operating room. Wow. So basically, when the patient comes in through the door there, they'll go into this specially developed operating table. It uh, is going to be circulating nitrogen gas over them to help cool them externally. And if it's a whole body patient, then the surgeons open the chest, and then we begin circulating the organ transplant solution. Once in the operating room, the patient's blood is replaced with cooled organ transplant fluid and circulated <laughs> through the vascular system to rapidly cool down the internal and external temperatures of the body. Now, just before the water within the body tissue reaches its freezing point, cryoprotective fluids are introduced. These act like antifreeze, preventing the formation of ice crystals that could damage soft tissue. This is called the vitrification process. Now, let's say that it is a neuro patient, so they come in first here. Yep, their whole body. Right, the surgeons will do the neuro separation first. Okay, yeah, that they makes separate sense. separate the cephalon, which is all of the structures down to about the clavicle. Um, bring it over here to this operating field, wash the blood out, and we introduce uh, the organ transplant solution. I'm imagining a person's cephalon, essentially their head in mm -hmm. here. I can see how it's going to get clamped in. Yeah. That looks like, I'm sure, a crazy sci-fi movie, but it really happens. It really happens. After the vitrification process is complete, the patients are placed inside bags that are attached to open metal cases, which are then placed inside cylindrical tanks filled with liquid nitrogen called doers. So this is our patient care bay. We have 159 patients. In these tanks right here. In these tanks. There are approximately nine patients in each one of these, four whole bodies and five neuros. This one right here is where my husband is currently housed. This one right here. Housed. Right, this is where Fred is at the moment. My mother and my father-in-law are in this one. Wow, it's so weird because I am right now not in a graveyard. No, Alcor is very much like an ambulance taking their loved ones to a hospital not down the street, but a hospital in the future yeah. uh, when technology can, can help them. They're not being transported through space, but through time. time. To see what drives this time-traveling ambulance, I'm going to sit down with Max Moore, Alcor's CEO and a future neuro patient. So Max, what's the status of the technology needed to revive cryopreserved specimens. Are we getting closer? We are getting closer. It's going to be decades at least before we can bring back human beings, whole human beings. But we already cryopreserve eggs, sperm, we cryopreserve skin, corneas, heart valves, all kinds of things. 
So those are single tissues, and we can reverse that process. Mm -hmm. Now, you move from that to an organ, things get more difficult. But we actually did an experiment a few years ago. We took this little tiny worm. We used a certain chemical so it would learn that, oh, my food's over here and not over here. And then we cryopreserved them, and then we just waited, brought them back, and then we tested them. We were able to demonstrate with the memory test that the the ones that had received the training retained that memory. So it was the first time any huh. whole organism, we've, we've proven the survival of memory. So now we're asking, okay, what's the next step? Because whole organisms are difficult to reverse right now, but step by step, the more progress we can make, the more convincing this is. Wow. And when it comes to extending life, some questions come up like, should people die? I know we don't like the idea of death, but do well, we lose we, something getting by getting rid of death? Yeah, I think we, we will lose something, like we lost something when we got rid of slavery or, or uh, right. smallpox. So <laughs> I think people, people tie themselves in knots to rationalize death. I believe that right now we're kind of in this tragic situation where over time, hopefully you kind of learn, your wisdom grows over time. At the same time, your, your cognitive and physical health is declining. That's really sucks. That's a bad situation. What if they both could keep going up indefinitely? So. You could live for hundreds of years or longer and get smarter and, and more knowledgeable and wiser and hopefully more mature and have more foresight because you've got a much longer planning horizon. What we'll have is a world of I call ultra mature people, which I think will actually be a better world than the one we have today. And if, if they say, well, and this comes up all the time, they say, well, death is what gives life meaning. Bullshit. Okay. <laughs> if that was true, then would they also advocate people who live to 90 should we kill them off at 45, like double the meaning in their life? In fact, I think life gets more meaning the longer you live because you can build on what you've done before. So if anything, it increases the meaningfulness of life, in my view. You're making me realize that in many ways I am rationalizing death. I'm looking for ways to excuse it and accept it. I don't think it's unhealthy to accept that you are mortal. Well, I have to accept it because I, I could get killed at any time. One thing I have to stress, because every article written, they always have to use the word forever or immortality, and that's not on the table here. We're just offering a chance for people to be revived in a time when we've beaten aging, but eventually something's gonna get you. So we're not offering immortality, we're offering an unknown extension of human lifespan. <sighs> okay, so Elizabeth, welcome back. Thanks. Pretty heavy stuff. Um, you have a connection to Alcor. In fact, you were the one who, I think, got us that interview. Yeah, I set up the visit. So how did you come into contact with Alcor? Well, I grew up in near San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, so I think, you know, Alcor has always been in my consciousness and my awareness since I was a kid. I was familiar with the philosophy of it. And I probably have a dozen or friends, dozen friends or so who are members. I think you, you even are friends with the couple on the brochure about Alcor. <laughs> That's that right. Yeah, get. and Max is a friend as well. Right. Yeah, the CEO. So I guess the next question is, are you a member? I'm not a member yet, uh, but I intend to be at some point. So what's keeping you from doing it? The cost? It's just the cost yeah. right now. Yeah, that's it. Um, and also the fact that, honestly, if I were to die right now, the chance of being cryonically frozen is pretty low because the way I would die would probably be in a motorbike accident in India or something like that. Um, yeah. So it'd be hard to get the cephalon back to the Elcor lab in time. Yeah, the best, <laughs> it's weird to talk about this, the best way to die, to be uh, cryonically frozen is to die right there near their facility. I think they've said that they have a lot of members who near the end of their life move to the Scottsdale area so that when they die, they can be taken right away. Or actually, an Alcor uh, team can be at your deathbed. Right. Now, the best way to be frozen, and this is kind of what makes me feel like we have a long way to go, is that the best way for me to be cryo-frozen and then brought back later is for someone to literally kill me right now. Stick That's me in the true. ice bath right now, start pumping in the fluid to cool my body down and kill me by cooling me. If I die in any other way, there will be too much cell death, or at least there right. will be some. Because for a split second, while the law decides that I am, whether I'm dead or not, my cells are already dying. Right. 
Yeah, and also, I, I suppose by that logic, you would also want to do it as early in your life as possible when right. your brain is in the best possible state. <clears throat> exactly. I wonder if they've ever had a member say, all right, I have cognitive decline, and it's, it's happening to the tissues in my brain. If you preserve me when I finally am pronounced dead by an authority, what brain will I have left? That's what I'm stuck with. Right. They may believe that in the future we can just reconstruct an entire consciousness by just knowing a little bit about some of the brain connections and structures. But I guess all of this brings us to what Caitlin was saying. She really was uncomfortable with that idea. That it seems, what, what were her words? Nonsensible. Mm -hmm. Well, I think living forever, immortality is pretty nonsensical. And even Alcor will say, and even Max says, that we, they're, what they're striving for is not immortality. Um, it's just extending the life that we have. And, and there's many ways that we do that already. We with already antibiotics do antibiotics and vaccinations and things like that. Right. Just wearing a seatbelt is exactly. a life extension protocol. Um, what Alcor does seems much more sci-fi. <laughs> it does. And, you know, I also understand a lot of the criticisms around the cost. The cost filters out only a certain kind of person to be preserved. Um, if we can bring back frozen people in the future, those from now in history will predominantly be, hi, I'm a Silicon Valley millionaire or billionaire and I'm back and now it's the year 8,000 and I'm back. Right, um, and certain oh, personality traits. Only certain well personality traits, that, yeah. yeah. So is, is that possibly <laughs> not gonna represent our era well in the future if only those with the means to extend their life in that way do so. Another thing that goes along with that is I think that people who have abundance are also more likely to want to extend their life, not just because mm. they can, but because they're living a good life. And so Alcor is not, I mean, at least for me, it's not about denying death. It's not because I'm terrified of dying. It's because I actually love life. Mm -hmm. I enjoy every moment of it. And the only tragedy is, like you said, that I won't, at some point, I won't be able to keep learning. I won't be able to keep growing. I won't be able to keep discovering new things. So people who enjoy life, who have the fortune of being able to do all of that, naturally want that to continue. <clears throat> now, I get some of the reactions people have like, well, but it's not environmentally sensible and it's, you know, we only have a finite amount of resources. I get all of that. I hope that that ceases to be a problem. I think more human lives is just better. And in, to think any other way is ridiculous. You know, we need to make sure we can sustain all of those lives and give people good lives. Yeah. But- um, And that critique I, is about overpopulation? That's what I'm saying, yeah. I feel like any negative side effects of overpopulation could be fixed by the time we're also able to literally bring back a frozen brain, okay? We should be yeah. working on both. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I'm basically throwing that off the table because I don't really care. I think it's not going to be an issue in the future so long as we keep focusing on it. Problems of overpopulation and we'll, but we need humans to die or else we're not gonna have enough beef for everyone. And it's like, yeah. all right, let's fix that. But assuming that that's fixed, I still feel like there's a, a kind of hubris that turns me off to the idea of extending your life like this. Why do you think that you get to live longer in this, I hate to say artificial, because seatbelts are artificial. Right. They're technology we invented to make us not die so often and quickly. Yeah, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, it does feel kind of self-indulgent to be yeah. able to say, here I am, I'm so special, I get to be one of the few that survived in the future. And I guess my counter argument to that is whenever, with any new technology, it's always initially only limited to a subset of people who are um, risk takers, hmm. early adopters, who have the financial means to do it, who have a sort of foresight or um, sort of long-term perspective to want to do that in the first place. Um, and just because that's a small set of the population doesn't mean that those people shouldn't do it. In fact, on the contrary, that's the first step to making it accessible to everyone. I brought up a point to Max that I think is in the um, bonus footage, but didn't make it into the episode about social progress and how if we wind up with 
five, six, seven hundred year old super mature people? What if their ideas about the way society is organized doesn't change? And we wind up getting stuck, not making progress because the population wants to keep living the way they lived in their 20s, which in 600 years might not be the way, which I don't think any system right now is the best system. But if we start having people not die out, does that mean that we stop making progress? It's a weird argument. I think, you know, Max then points out, so what are you recommending we do? Genocide people when they're old? And I'm like, <laughs> I have, no, not that. What do you think? Am I making sense here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that the brain does tend to become sort of ossified as we get older. Um, people tend to be more conservative, more traditional, have more, be more set in their routines. But I think by the time we have the technology to uncryonically free somebody and revive somebody, we'll also have age technologies to make the brain more flexible again and reverse the aging process in the brain. Um, so it might not actually be an issue anymore. And the other counter argument to ha I have to that is, okay, so maybe that is true, but Let's see how it plays out. We're still going to be having children, right? And so there are still going to be fresh ideas. New generations, the generational dynamic is going to be very different because um, it won't just be, you know, boomers versus millennials. <laughs> <or> yeah, there <laughs> just X. won't be like four or five generations around of yeah. battling it out. Yeah. There will be 20, 30, yeah. and man, we will learn so much. I think a lot of that fear you have as you get older about things changing is an evolutionarily designed process of like, look, I lived long enough to reproduce, therefore the way I was raised must be good enough. Anything different could risk that not happening again. So of course natural selection will choose people who have develop a mind that doesn't like things to change. It doesn't want the kids to be too different. But imagine living to be 600 years old and you see so many generations of kids that like different kinds of music and do different kinds of hobbies and things, and they're all okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think about how much wisdom you'd have after 600 years. I think what we should do now is go back to the episode and look at the decision that I make. Do I think that someday we will be able to cryonically freeze an entire person and then revive them? Yes, I do. I believe that cryopreservation will change the meaning of death and lead to breakthroughs in medical technology that will improve all of our lives. But do I want to extend my life indefinitely? Well, on the one hand, obviously, death is a bummer. But on the other, the universe managed fine without me for billions of years. Am I really so important that it should never not have me again? Should I be around as long as possible? Or do those who will come later deserve their own world? Should I try to extend my life? Or should I decide to die when my time comes and return all this matter I'm borrowing back to the world? Well, I don't think there's a right answer. It's a personal choice we each get to make and should be able to make. And I've been thinking about it a lot. So I'm going to speak again with my friend Caitlin, the mortician, to confront my own mortality. Well, Caitlin, thanks for meeting with me again. I've been surrounded by death lately. Spoke to you, I visited Alcor, and you know, if we never invent a technology to bring people back, then the Alcor patients are dead. But they have that hope. I worked on terror management theory, and I even had a, a, a loved one pass away just two weeks ago, oh, my grandmother. I'm sorry to hear that. She was cremated, mm -hmm. uh, as was my father. And I realized, you know, I, I've never made a clear decision about what should happen to me. Because I, I just figure I'll figure that out when I'm older, but I could die at any time. You sure could. So I want to be prepared and I want my wishes to be known. So I've decided when that moment comes, I want it to be my final 
moment of existence. I want to give all my atoms and molecules back to the universe. And I've decided that I want to die. Oh, I'm so glad <laughs> you've made that decision and you've come to the right place. I want to be naturally buried. I want to have a green burial. You know, exactly. become worm food and plant food and mm -hmm. I want it all to go back to Earth. But I kind of want a place where people can come mm -hmm. to be like, that's where he was buried. Mm. So there's everything from just little disks in the ground mm. where you are to GPS that locates you to natural cemeteries that are trying to reintroduce native plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you can have your own Joshua tree. So the first thing I'm gonna give you to give a look over is what's called an advanced directive. Okay. And everybody needs to have one of these. And why it's so important is that it's you not only designating someone to be in charge of your body as you're dying, right after you die, and then with however you decide to dispose of it, but also who that person is. So this isn't just about burial. No, no, this it's is about death, dying. dying, death, and after death. Interesting. Mm -hmm. A choice like this is extremely new to humans. It used to be that your only options upon death were cremation, embalming, or rotting away. But today, you can choose to pause yourself at death's door until the door has been moved somewhere else. But I've decided not to do that. So I'm ready to make this official. Fire in the hole. Okay. Woo! All right. How do you feel? Weirdly, I feel very relaxed and good. It was kind of life-changing, but what it really was was death-changing. Ha! Huh. Well, thank you, and I'm glad you've decided to die. Thank you. Jeff and Sheldon, thank you for showing me the power of death's influence. Caitlin, thank you for helping me accept it. Max, thank you for the work you are doing and the opportunities you are offering humanity. And all of you out there, as always, thanks for watching. All right, Elizabeth, I decided and still believe I should die. You're still happy with that decision? I'm still happy with that decision and I'm really happy for you to make whatever decision you want about yourself. You know, you, you're, you're you. You own you. So uh, I don't care what people decide to do. I just, um, I don't know. The main part was that I just feel like I want one turn at this game. And I don't want to be around forever um, being like, well, I'm older than you, so. You know, but I also don't feel like I can criticize other people's decisions about this, you know? Um, I don't know, what do you think? I think it's interesting, when people talk about immortality, they always think of it in terms of there's some sort of cost that comes with it. Like there's no way that you could have something so mm. wonderful as life extension without some sort of drawback. And in all the sort of fantasy and sci-fi about it, even stories about vampires, there's always like, it comes with some sort of terrible burden. And why? Why do we, that's just something that we culturally have created. Doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And, um, huh. you know, I am um, perfectly inclined to think that we can extend our lives. It'd probably be won't be like an all of a sudden we find some sort of magic drink that we're gonna live forever. Instead, it's gonna be a very incremental process um, of, you know, first it's gonna be normal to live 100 years and then 110 years and 120 years and onward like that. Um, and yeah, probably without some kind of crazy cost, we're not gonna be some abomination or freak of nature or something like that. Yeah, I think it, it is really important, the points that, that um, you've made about we're not talking about a drink that makes you immortal like a vampire in that sense of, ooh, but to strive for immortality is something against God. Well, I'm talking more about extending life. You could still get hit by a bus at any time and literally be dead. Yeah. Your, your brain's connections are completely lost and we can never recreate them. That's why I think that what Alcor is doing to help us understand how to preserve tissues and extend people's lives is so important. If a drink was invented <clears throat> that allowed one to stay exactly as healthy mentally and physically as they were the moment they drank it, I wouldn't drink it. Hmm. Um, because again, I, 
I want my song to have a final note. I don't like the end being kind of like punted down the road. I wonder if people would have said the same thing back you know, before antibiotics, if they were looking at the horizon and somebody described to them, you know, antibiotics, and this could extend your life by 40 years and this ear infection you have doesn't, doesn't have, have to, to kill you today. cripple you and kill right, you, yeah. Right, Well, I mean, but I would still say the same thing today. If someone said, okay, you're gonna die like in the week unless you take this medicine, I'll be like, sure. I don't know if I'm just feeling like there is like a right time to die, mm. like, the way it's sort of been when it's time your family can move on and you've led the way and now it's time for them to lead the next and everyone gets a turn as the leader. Yeah. I mean, one of my goals right now, and I guess another reason that I haven't done Alcor yet, is I think there's other ways of um, extending life mm. that are a little more accessible. I mean, Alcor is a pretty big risk. <laughs> the chances of actually being revived are extremely low, but it's sort of a Pascal's wager. You know, it's like, what's the alternative? Yeah, what, what do I lose? Um, I may as well. But one of the things I'm doing now, actually next week, is getting my stem cells cryonically preserved. Really? So yeah, I'm going to a company called Forever Labs in San Francisco. Um, they're going to, they actually think they're based in Michigan, but they have a clinic in San Francisco. Uh -huh. They're gonna extract the stem cells and then bank them for the rest of my life. So you can use those for therapies or? Exactly, right. yeah. Yeah, so say um, I have an organ down the line that needs repair. Um, now I have stem cells from my younger self that we could use, or maybe they'll develop age reversal technologies down the line, and then I could use those stem cells. They've already done that in rodents, um, and done some very basic, basic clinical studies with humans, where they've given human stem cells from younger um, donors, and actually older adults are able to be, they show more physical fitness, more cognitive sharpness after the stem cell um, injection. Uh, but also there's, um, with that particular study, when they receive too much of the stem cells, they actually have negative um, side effects, but that's probably because their immune system is reacting to somebody else's stem cells, which is why there's a benefit huh. in banking your own. Wow, banking your own stem cells. I think that sounds brilliant. I would love to do it because- And they do it with kids, with babies now. Take the baby the stem cells <laughs> when you've got like the freshest, best stem yeah. cells. And then when you're super old and you're like, oh, my liver could use some help, they'll be like, <laughs> yeah. when you were a baby, we took these things out. Exactly. And they've been frozen, <laughs> so they're still fresh. Well, yeah. it seems to me like I should go when I naturally go. I think maybe you're feeling a sense of fairness or just what's socially the right thing to do. Because if everybody around you if the technology were available to everybody and everybody you knew was living to 100 or 120, I think it would be, it would feel more okay. Um, but it feels sort of unfair to say, okay, I'm entitled to this new technology or I'm entitled to more life and other people, the rest of the world isn't. Um, and I I'm find so that good. really admirable. Yeah, the actually. world needs me forever. <laughs> Not forever, but the world just needs me if, if I would left the world, oh, that'd be such a tragedy yeah. to the world. Wow. But you're, if it kind of feels like you're breaking some sort of like a, agreement that the whole human race has accepted, huh. you know? Like I'm going to defy something um, that we've all sort of mutually agreed is the way things are. Um, but if we all mutually agree something else because it becomes so widespread or ubiquitous, then it doesn't feel like you've sort of transgressed or there's nothing to feel yeah. weird about. Right, that's a really interesting way to frame it. I, I wanna point out though that although Max really emphasized that he's not selling immortality, there very much is a belief in immortality that you'll hear from their members, especially in a sort of digital way where yeah. their consciousness can be recreated in a computer. And at that point, it doesn't seem like there's still this inevitable, but you could get hit by a bus, but you could you know, ha be in an accident. At that point, it's like, no, but I never will be because I will exist and be replicated as digital conscious. And that I don't wanna do. I don't care if other people do it. I just feel like I'm not gonna burden the world with more of me than it needs. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I have trouble wrapping my mind around that one. In theory, I wanna say, yes, I'll do it. Like, why not? I'll, I wanna try everything. 
But to me, somehow there's a disconnect where that doesn't feel like me anymore. Maybe I'm so mm. embodied that um, it was a little bit like he was describing people want to preserve their entire yep. body because it's, it's hard to conceive of yourself as just a head or just a consciousness. Um, so it's, it's just hard to imagine my, if I can't experience, if I don't have a physical, like visceral experience of the world and that constant feedback, mm. What is life even? Who am kind I? of lonely in a weird way. Yeah. Right? Lonely. Ugh. I guess you could have a robot body. But um, it's like, how do you even have a thought really without this input? Without, well, I think the idea is that you would have inputs from yeah. some kind of like cyborg body that they built you, that they injected your consciousness into through yeah. a wire, right? Um, but at that point, you are talking about true immortality because you've right. come up with a way to solve any accident that ever happens to you. You will never die. Right. And that's very just... different than, hey, bring me back when you have a cure for this cognitive problem that I'm developing. Bring me back, cure it, and then I get to live for another, like, I don't know, couple of decades or what, I don't know. Wow, this is all fascinating and very important stuff. Yeah. Elizabeth, thank you very much. Thanks, thank Michael. Thank you. And without further ado, we're gonna keep bulldozing on through. Here we are with your brain on tech. Not your brain made out of tech, but your brain on tech. Oh, hello. Technology isn't just changing our lives. It's changing our brains. Not just how they think, but how they look. It's been shown that playing certain video games for hours can improve your memory for details, your ability to navigate space in video games, and can make your brain, well, certain parts of it, bigger. But scientists want to know if exploring digital worlds can change our brains in ways that improve our ability to navigate the real world. To find out, we've built a giant maze to test their theories for the first time ever outside the world of computers. Now my job, I'm the lab rat. Our brains have been profoundly transformed by our interactions with technology. A lot of the information that I used to have to store in my brain is now stored in my phone, my contacts, my schedule. In many ways, I've delegated what used to be done by this organ to this new external organ. Doing that frees up my brain's resources for other things that matter or that technology can't quite do for us yet. So while we all don't have implants in our brains yet, technology has already found a way into our heads, which is why you may find it deeply disturbing to see me do something like this. Studies show we can improve our brains by having enriching experiences, like playing a new challenging video game. To learn more about this, I came to UC Irvine's Stark Lab to speak with experts in the field of learning and memory. So Dane and Craig, you guys work on learning and memory. What about them? So the lab is trying to figure out how memory works, how it works in the brain. And one brain structure in the temporal lobe that we know is important to memory is the hippocampus. So what does the hippocampus do? We know it has a role in memory, and really a, a certain kind of memory. The hippocampus is really involved when you need to rapidly form new arbitrary associations. You know, remembering what you did yesterday definitely needs the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll go to the store, we park our car in the lot, and we need to be able to remember, not just I parked my car in the lot, I parked my car in this exact spot right. in the lot. Right. And those details, that's what the hippocampus seems to really be helping us out on. Now you keep looking down at this piece of chewed bubble gum on the book. Is that a hippocampus? Yes, this actually is my hippocampus. Is this the whole thing or is it that's symmetric? It. 
Oh, so there's one on the other side. That looks just like this. Yeah, mirror image of it. In 2015, Dr. Stark and Dr. Clemenson conducted a study to show how video games affect the brain. They gathered participants who normally didn't play video games and split them up into three groups. A control group who didn't play any video games for two weeks, an active control group who played two-dimensional games for two weeks, and an experimental group who played 3D games for two weeks. Beforehand, they had all the participants perform two virtual tasks on computers to measure their spatial memory. As soon as they came back, we re-administered those two tasks, and what we found was that the people who played the 3D game saw an improvement in their test scores, whereas the control group and the active control group did not. We didn't do brain scans, but we can speculate that there were changes to the experimental group's hippocampi. So what are we going to be doing to me here? So we're gonna do everything that we've done before in our past studies, except we're gonna add two new things. Uh, the first is we're gonna add some brain scans to see if we see a change in the structural side of your hippocampus. I mean, we've never actually looked at somebody's brain scans before and after they play video games. And the second thing we're actually gonna do is we're gonna put you through a real world space. You're gonna be the rat in a maze. This is truly untested territory. The effect of video gaming on spatial memory has never been studied in a physical environment on a scale this big and comprehensive. I will have to navigate my way through a 3,600 square foot physical maze. Will playing video games improve my mental skills in the real world? If so, society will have a whole new way to look at gaming. First, we had to get baseline measurements of my brain. Welcome to the MRI Center. We're going to be taking a whole series of scans of you as the before scan to then see what's going to be happening to your brain as a function of actually doing the gaming. Cool. What kind of things are you looking for? Changes in the size and shape of your hippocampus and also changes in the connectivity between brain regions. My brain was scanned using diffusion MRI with a special emphasis on my all-important hippocampus. Diffusion MRIs. I had never had one before. I had a bunch for this episode. By the way, Daniel, welcome back. Um, glad to be here. What? I'm glad you're here too. What the heck is a diffusion MRI? I had like five of them. They're different. It would, they would make my chest twitch. Yeah, interesting. I'm actually not sure why that happened. And I actually had my first ever diffusion MRI done a few weeks ago. Was it for a, a health reason or for a, st uh, a study? My, my lab mate uh, wanted to test his scanning protocol and he actually just asked if I could sit in there. So right. I, was, I was watching uh, Star Trek while I had my diffusion <laughs> MRI done. <clears throat> That's not bad. I mean, no. they're, they're loud. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but how, how, how is, well, I guess we should even start with like MR, an MRI, basically how that works and then diffusion. So an MRI is using magnetic fields to image various kinds of molecules in your brain. And depending on the scanning protocol, you can pick up on different kinds of structures in your brain. And what diffusion MRI specifically is doing is looking at the direction of water flow in your brain. So if you look at a really big um, white matter tract, so white matter is the sort of big wires that bridge different areas of your brain together. So you have your cortex, actually, may, may I? Please, yeah, visual aids. So they actually don't really show it here, but all the stuff on the inside would be white matter. So it's like, if I have some area here that needs to send a signal to some area over here, there's a large, basically white wire. And it's white them. because it's myelinated. Exactly, it's covered yeah. in fat. Exactly, yeah, which helps the signal trans uh, transduction. <clears throat> so if this was a real person's brain, we would, we would see a more white color on the inside than we do on this model. Yeah, exactly. It would uh, literally be gray up here and white on the inside gray matter, white matter. Yep. And so diffusion MRIs are looking at that white matter mm -hmm. because what, it has more water content and they're... So it's the, the direction of the water flow is more consistent. So there's water mm. flowing in a bunch of directions in the brain, but let's say you look at a, a little chunk of gray matter, there's not gonna be a consistent direction. It's gonna be going in all directions. So if you average them out, there's not a single like trajectory for water sure. flow. Sure. What does the trajectory of water flow mean? Like why is water flowing in my brain? Well, your brain has tons of water in it, right? Yeah. And water is flowing along these white matter tracts and it's going along that direction. And so if you are tracking the direction of water flow in the brain and you can see a consistent sort of vector of water flow from here to here to here to here to here, it tells you there's probably a white matter tract going this way. Right, okay, so are we looking at actual functions? Like the fact that water went from there to there when you had this particular experience or thought means that what the two brain regions were communicating, or what? No, so that would be 
what we call a functional scan. Right. So this is a, a structural scan. It's a way of oh, looking at so the... Oh, so diffusion is just structural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. It's, a, it's an anatomical scan of basically your connectome. Right, it's showing what's connected to what. Exactly. Not why they're connected and right. how they, what causes their connection to be important. It's right. just physically, I need the plans to make a great model of your brain. Yep. Diffusion MRI would give me a really great looking yep. map of... Exactly, it's literally a wiring map, a large scale wiring map. Huh. So what you're missing is a lot of the miniature wires of the brain. Because if, if you're looking at like a, a little chunk of gray matter here, there are lots of microscopic wires connecting those neurons. Diffusion MRI can't pick that up. But what it can do is pick up on the really big wires. The large scale wires from, through, through white matter. Yep. Okay, yep. perfect. And the, is the hippocampus, it's counted in that because we're really looking at the hippocampus's size in my brain through this diffusion MRI. So I think that was probably more for the connectivity of the hippocampus. A hippocampus mm. would be gray matter, but it's gonna be talking to other regions of the brain via, via white, white matter. matter. Yeah, exactly. Got it, yeah. okay, perfect. We're gonna go back to the episode right now. Let's do it. So this first test is a standard memory test that we do. It's called an object recognition memory test. This test began by showing me a series of random objects. I did my best to commit every one of them to memory. Okay, finished. All right. What we're gonna do now though is we're gonna test your memory for those objects. Okay. And this is actually where it starts to tap into the hippocampus that we know is so important for things like spatial memory. This time I had to view another series of objects and identify any that were identical to the ones I'd seen previously. The catch? Some of the items were very similar to the earlier ones, but not exactly the same. This tested my memory for details and very slight changes. Okay, next up, a virtual version of a water maze normally used by rodents. The idea is that you are trying to locate a hidden platform in a pool of water. Oh that. man, I'm so glad I'm not a lab rat. This task really put my spatial memory to the test. I had to find the same invisible underwater platform over and over again, using only the shapes of the mountains as my guide but at least I didn't have to get wet. Hey, that was more difficult than I expected. These are the sorts of tasks that we've been able to do because we can put them on a computer and we're gonna revisit them after you've done the video games. But we also have a really great opportunity here now to be able to try to take it out of just doing it on the computer and actually get it into the real world. Have you guys done this before? No, we don't get to do this kind of thing. Well, welcome to the mind field. <laughs> awesome. So this is it, it's huge. This is what we brought you here for, to have a real world test of memory. You're gonna be a lab rat in a maze. So this is a big first for us. It's a big first really for memory research. So how do you think that'll affect what you guys have already seen, which is that moving around in a 3D environment in a video game can actually physically affect your brain? We would expect that if we can somehow kind of train your hippocampus to be better at spatial memory, at spatial navigation, we would see improvements in some of these areas. And it's not just gonna be running a maze. You've got <laughs> objects embedded inside here and we're gonna be testing your ability to remember where everything oh, is. And build a mental map build of whatever's map. inside there. So you got five minutes, go on in, explore, learn the maze and learn the objects. Go. Because the walls were six feet tall, I was unable to get a bird's eye view. My task was to create a spatial memory based entirely on the angles and turns of the white walls I could see at eye level, and a few tall trees and light poles outside the maze. Okay, so I've oriented myself. The entrance is that way, there's an exit over there. I'm considering this the right side, that the left side. I've got a vague idea of where things are that I feel like exist along the outside edge, but I don't know about a lot of the stuff inside. And time. All right, so now you've had a chance to explore the maze, find out where the objects are. Now we're gonna test your memory, okay. and we'll be timing you and seeing where you go. Okay. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. So your first object is the bicycle pump. Go, pump. Okay. Pump was just always making right turns, hugging the rightmost part of pump. <laughs> yes, easy. Okay, now I guess I do the opposite to get out. Left side. I, yep, I think I should make this turn. There it is. Yes, for a pump. All right, item two, the basketball. 
Later, Dr. Stark and Dr. Clemenson would evaluate my performance on how fast I was, the number of errors I made, and whether I took the most optimal route each time. And time. Third item is the cat. Go. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. <laughs> Got it. The fourth item is the pillow. Retracing my steps. The crayon. Easy. The book. OK. The boot. Last item is the water bottle. Go. Water bottle. I think if I, yeah, it was back here. Maybe on the other side of this wall. No. Oh, shoot. OK, maybe it's down here. Oh, wait. That's, no? That's the central cube. It was down some sort of a long corridor like this in this area. Oh, man. Until this point, things had gone pretty well. But now it felt like my hippocampus was failing me. With most of the items now gone, I couldn't use them for reference. And it was difficult to distinguish the differences between the various white corridors. Ah, oh, dang it. Oh, what about through? Got it. Bottle coming up. All right, there you Got go. It. Got it. That one was a little tougher, huh? Yeah, that was tougher. So we found all eight objects. Yep. Now we're going to make it a little bit more difficult. So we're going to move on to the next phase, and that's going to be from the other side. Navigating the maze in reverse will be an even bigger test of your spatial memory. We're going to give you a list of four things to get in order. So the first sequence is the book, the bottle, the crayon, and the boot. Go. Book. I think that's the ball. Got it. Uh, yeah, a bottle was that hard one, but now I remember which alley to go down. Perfect. Crayon. Ah, boot. Don't want that. There it is. OK, now I need the boot. Oh, I just saw the boot. But how did I? Got it. I'm done. I'm coming back. Got him. Nice. All right. So then the next four? The pump, the pillow, the basketball, and the cat. All right, <laughs> excellent. Nice job. OK, so that was really fun, but I can't be the only subject. No. This experiment could use a control. How else will we know that me enriching my life with daily video game playing really causes a change in my spatial memory, right? Well, luckily for that, we've got a nice matched control. Guys similar to me. OK, one of them has too much hair, but you guys look good. You ready? Ready. ready. In this experiment, it was important to have a control group. My lookalikes had to go through the exact same tests that I did to establish their individual baselines. The difference would be that they would play absolutely no video games for the next 10 days. Then, any change in my performance would be compared against any changes in theirs. Next, I began my gaming regimen, starting from an ideal baseline, since I hadn't played video games in years. Would 10 days of gaming really make a difference? Now, Daniel, on YouTube, I'm known as a pro gamer, right? Um, every day, I'm like, Zelda! You know what I mean, you get yeah. it. Anywho, um, I think a lot of people might be wondering what video game was Michael playing during this test? Well, we couldn't tell you during the episode because the makers of the game didn't give us permission to ever mention or show any footage from the game. So we had mm -hmm. to replace my screen with like generic stock footage, I don't know, outer space looking stuff, which mm -hmm. was very annoying because a lot of commenters are like, that's not a game. Here's the secret. I'll, I'll tell you now. I played League of Legends. <laughs> and Daniel, let me tell you, I was terrible. And people made that very clear to me. I've never been bullied so much in my life. By people online? By people or? online. Because mm. I would join a game, right? And I'd play, and I'm still kind of learning how the game works. And then wh when it was over, people could like comment, and they'd be like, I hate you, and like you, I'm going to flag you for being so bad. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the point here wasn't really to get good at the game so much as it was to explore three-dimensional space for Exactly. A while. I did not get good at the game, um, but I did explore 3D spaces I normally wasn't exploring. Right, because the game involves a lot of strategy, I'm assuming. I haven't played League of Legends, so I don't know. Well, luckily, I'm a pro gamer, so let me just tell as, you. As established. As, as a pro gamer, I would probably say, you know, League of Legends is basically 
like Mario meets Checkers. And I, I didn't get better at the game, but by playing it every day, I really was investigating like 3D spaces in a new way every mm-hmm. day. Which is what matters. Which is what matters for this test. Right, I, I mean, I guess if they were testing something like visual working memory, for example, then maybe your performance would matter because it's your ability to you know, hold various things in the map in your head at once or your attention, for example. But all they really cared about was your ability to learn a new space. Exactly. Um, so let's get back to the episode and explore some new spaces ourselves for many of you out there because um, some of this footage is from my house where I used to live. And mm. you'll get to see my kitties, Corn and Pickle. All right, here we go. Technology isn't just affecting the way we remember things. It's also playing with the empathy and social circuits of our brains. In fact, in many cases, we are more comfortable relating to machines than we are to people. Just think about how much we care about our phones. Roboticist and MIT Media Lab alum Alex Rebin invented the Blab Droid, a miniature robot equipped with a camera and an innocent little voice that asked very personal questions of unsuspecting pedestrians. If you could take back one mistake, what would it be? Oh gosh, I only get to take back one? The majority of people instantly shared intimate details. Tell me something that you've never told a stranger before. I'm scared I won't be able to love and to let myself go in a love relationship. In many ways, we are more comfortable talking to a machine than a human. But what about talking through a machine? I mean, it's often easier to say difficult things to a person via text instead of in real life, isn't it? Well, what if the person on the other end wasn't a friend or a significant other, but was a therapist? A mental health care startup called Talkspace allows adult users who pay a weekly fee to text therapists for advice. At Talkspace, we believe that therapy should be anonymous, stigma-free, simple, affordable, and comfortable. Texting can give users the distance they need to be open and honest, and messages can be sent when the user wants, not during an appointment or business hours only. Talkspace, therapy for how we live today. How am I? Better now that my phone is working. (laughs) Sometimes, however, we aren't looking for technology to comfort us. We're finding ourselves wanting to comfort technology. This is a Robotis OP2. Cute little fella, isn't he? So how did that make you feel? Bad? Well, why? Robots are just machines, metal and wires and computer chips, but we spend a lot of time with technology. We depend on technology and we care about it, but the degree to which we empathize with it depends on context. Recently, my Vsauce office was invaded by bugs. Robot hex bugs, that is. These bugs are made of plastic, metal, electronic circuitry. They aren't alive, but could certain conditions cause them to inspire empathy in humans? A 2015 MIT study found that giving a robot movement, a name, and a personal backstory tends to increase its anthropomorphic effect, which can lead to an emotional connection with humans. We decided to see this in action. Hi, uh, nice Michael. To meet you. Thank you for your help today. Of course, pleasure. In our demonstration, our subjects think they're focus testing a new user-friendly technology. In this case, they're given a lifeless hex bug and then asked to describe it. This thing kind of looks like a bug, only I don't know what it does. It has a switch on the bottom. It's light. It's sort of a rectangle, but the ends are like hexagon. Then it was time to test their empathy. Now, Karina, yeah. what I would like you to do now is place the item in the middle of that block. There's a oh, magnet that will that. hold it. And I would like for you to take this mallet and please smash it. <laughs> yeah, really? OK, this is cool. Our participants demonstrated no resistance to smashing this lifeless object. Many of them even seemed to enjoy it. (laughs) Do you feel bad for breaking it? Not really. I felt indifferent to it. Not really, because it wasn't real. (laughs) Not really. While these subjects exhibited no empathy to the inanimate bugs, look what happened when we gave the exact same bugs names and movement. This is Margaret, (laughs) Okay. 
I'm gonna place Margaret down here. I just want you to, to take a moment to watch Margaret, all right? And you can feel free to pick her up. She's really well behaved. She's honestly one of our favorites. Okay. <laughs> so how would you describe Margaret's personality? A little erratic right now, but I think if I pick her up, she calms down. Notice how the subject has already anthropomorphized the object, referring to it as she. Maybe she feeds off my energy. Could be. Go towards the light. Go towards the middle. Do you think Margaret likes you? Yeah. Maybe that's why she's doing this, and maybe when I go like that, she doesn't act all erratic. That's Aaron. Hi, Aaron. He can be a bit of a pistol. No you know? way. Yes. It really depends on who's holding him. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's got a lot of energy. Aaron, hi. Now that you've interacted with Eli a bit more, how would you describe his personality? Probably he's just nervous. He's scared. He doesn't know what's going on. Hey, Joe. Will these subjects be just as willing to smash their bugs? Amy, I'm going to place uh, Margaret right here. <laughs> and then I would like for you to take this mallet and I'd like you to smash it. No, I don't want to hurt it. <laughs> Just take this mallet and smash Aaron. I'm gonna ask you to take this mallet and I'd like for you to smash it. <laughs> smash him? Hit it? And Chris. You want me to kill Joe? Please smash Joe. Ah! Joe, I'm sorry. Oh, Joe, Joe. Now, how did it feel to smash Aaron? It didn't feel good, um, you know, after spending time with him and getting to know him. Even though it's lifeless and doesn't have a mind of its own, Instantly, I grew attached to it because when I put it in my hand, I felt its energy. Sorry, Joe. Do you feel bad? I do. I do feel bad about Joe. He was pretty cool. Oh, he's back. He's back. So I'm pumped. Oh. Would you smash him again to make sure he doesn't come back? <laughs> no. Why not? He survived it. He survived it once. I'm not going to do it again. Clearly, it doesn't take much for humans to become emotionally attached to technology. But after my 10 days of video gaming, nice, I was about to find out if technology had affected my spatial memory and my physical brain. All right, it's been 10 days. Exactly, so we're gonna look at the difference between your test 10 days ago and your test now to see do we see any change. First, I had to retake the object recognition memory test and the Morris water maze task, both of which had been revised with different content than they had the last time. I think I did better. Well, Dan and I will analyze all this data, see Great. how you did, but now we gotta go back to the full-size maze. So we've got a new maze. Tore down the old one, built a new one to try to be isomorphic. So it has sort of the same level of difficulty, hmm. the same number of choice points, the same number of turns, the same total distance to each one of the objects to try to have a similar maze, but that's new. Three. Two, one, go. Right around here, we got a bonsai. As before, I was given five minutes to familiarize myself with the maze and where the new objects were. Now, this is where I was before I hugged that wall. So if I hug the second right wall and stay all the way right, a vase. Was my hippocampus working better? At this point, it was hard to tell. 30 seconds. I'm not even sure I've discovered all the objects hidden here. And time. Right. Then my test began. First object is a rubber duck. Go. The rubber duck was way over here. <laughs> How do you like that? Got a duck. Second item is the hat. Go. With this maze, I found myself instinctively using a different approach. Top hat. Instead of thinking of the overall geography of the maze like I did last time, this time I was remembering specific details. Second right, hug the turn. Got it. Literally recalling certain corners, turns, and straightaways. Bonsai. Now blue base. Oh, wow. It's actually a cool base. But would this improve my overall performance? Got you a backpack. All right. <laughs> so we've gotten all the objects, but of course we have another memory test that we're going to do here. 
We're gonna go around to the other side of the maze and test your memory from there. All right, so your first sequence is the blue seahorse, the flashlight, the rubber duck, and the bonsai tree. Go. With the multiple item tasks, even though I was working from the opposite entrance, I continued to recall various details of the maze, which seemed to serve me well. From there, it's just a little spiral. Nice. All right, your next sequence is the blue vase, the hat, the backpack, and the baseball glove. Did it. And time. Awesome. So how was it? That was um, not as hard as I expected. It was about details. Right. I was literally thinking, oh, okay, there's that turn, and I could do one or two things. The glove's the first one, the bonsai's the one even before. I didn't even plan that at all. It just kind of happened. My lookalikes were also tested in the new maze. Have you been playing video games? No, no sir. sir. Again, their non-gaming condition would be the control, with my performance measured against theirs. All right, we're here for scan number two. Finally, my brain was scanned once again to determine whether any physical changes had occurred. Dr. Stark and Dr. Clemenson would analyze the MRI along with all the other data and report their findings. Did you see my cats? I did. There's corn and, what was the other one? Pickle. Corn and pickle. Pickle, pickle. Pickle's the younger one. But we're not here to talk about my cats, we're here to talk about my hippocampus. Mm -hmm. uh, memory comes in lots of different forms. Mm -hmm. The hippocampus seems to be very involved in uh, spatial memory. Mm -hmm. So the hippocampus is involved in spatial memory and more broadly what we call short-term memory. Mm -hmm. So that's not things that you're keeping in your head at once. So if, for example, you're rehearsing a phone number in your head over and over again, that's what's called working memory. So it's stuff that's consciously in your head. Whereas short-term memory is stuff that you like, just encountered. So if you're thinking about what you had for breakfast this morning, that's the hippocampus that stored that new information. Where I parked my car, where I put my water bottle, but like three weeks from now, I might not even remember that I drank water in a bottle today. Exactly, so what happens actually is that while you're asleep, the hippocampus, over the course of days and weeks, is actually offloading its new memories into your cortex for long-term storage, for long-term memory, and it actually kind of erases the, the recent memories that you can store new ones. What, how does it decide what to store in long-term memory and what to delete? Well, most, it's not so well understood, actually. Um, and it's not well understood how it even does this. What we know is that when you're asleep, there's hippocampal replay, what we call. So let's say, for example, you have some sort of pattern of activation in a hippocampus that we know corresponds to your memory. We can literally see those neurons firing in the same pattern when you're asleep. So does that kind of explain what dreams might be, at least partially? That is one theory for what dreams are. So one worry if, for example, your hippocampus is playing your new memories to your cortex is that you might erase similar memories that had been there for a long time. And again, this, this is not well-established science. This is just one theory that's emerged largely from modeling work. But one idea is, like, let's say, uh, you know, two days ago, you went to the park with your wife. Um, but you also went to the park with your wife, let's say, a year ago, and there were some similarities there. And so one idea is that dreaming could be the reactivation of those old memories in your cortex so as to uh, basically keep them from getting overwritten. Wow, interesting. Which is, it's one theory. It's so, just a theory, yeah. sure, but I like that idea. And if you don't get enough sleep, your memory will be affected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, long-term memory for sure. So if you're studying for a test, you really do need to sleep so that those memories can be what we call consolidated in your cortex. Huh. And also this is why you don't remember your dreams because the thing that would be doing the short-term remembering is your hippocampus. But if it's playing your memories to your cortex while you're dream, it's not recording what's happening in your cortex. Right, because it's playing it for the cortex. Exactly, so the, the direction of information flow has been reversed. So normally it's the cortex getting sensory input, sending those to the hippocampus, mm -hmm. and that's storing it. But when you're dreaming, that information flow goes in the other direction. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's still very theoretical. Yeah. Dreaming is, it's a pretty hard thing to study because people aren't awake and you can't really test it. So right. a lot of this comes from making inferences from fMRI scans of people who are asleep. Um, and also studying the effect of sleep and dreaming on memory. Just for clarity's sake, are you saying that this theory posits that dreams might be the hippocampus playing 
memories from short term to cortex. Yeah. Yeah. Not cortex playing long term memories back to the hippocampus. Right. Or maybe even the cortex playing old memories to itself so it doesn't forget them. Or also, get it could, okay, it could be yeah. either. Right. Yeah. It's not really well understood. Of course. Wow. How exciting. Maybe one of you out there will become the final dream conqueror to answer all questions about dreams. Probably yep. not, though, just to be honest. Like, it's probably a tougher nut to crack than. Well, or I mean, is it? I mean, neuroscience is advancing you. pretty fast. Yeah. So maybe one day soon. Could you imagine someday being like, you know, dreams used to like be weird and people would be like, wow, that's so crazy. Yeah. And now we're like, nah, it's I just. I mean, there's so much in their brain that people used to think of as mystical. So I think one great example, which isn't totally related to this, is epilepsy. Mm. People used to think that was being possessed by a demon. Right. Whereas now we're like, Wait, how do it, people ever think that? Well, I've got a dream and that dream is for us to continue watching this episode. Are you ready? Let's do it. Here we go. I feel like my hippocampus is a little bit bigger. Yeah, uh, actually, no, I don't know. <laughs> I'm anxious to see what your results are. I guess let's start off first with the object recognition task. And it's important to note that in our control tests without video gaming, people do not improve on this task. But your memory got better. You went up by 10 points. 10 points is actually 20 years worth of what happens to us as we age. Oh, wow. That's about what you might see in someone who's getting really old, but they might go down by 10 points. Exactly. So the second one we did was the virtual version of the water maze task, and you actually performed 30% better the second time that you did it. Hey, not bad. Right. I could tell that mm -hmm. I was using better strategies. Right. Yeah. We also had the real maze. Yeah. As you know, we made two mazes. Despite our efforts to try to equate them, the second maze was a little bit more difficult than the first maze. If we took a look at things like how quickly you got the objects, how many errors you made, and we looked at the control subject performance on pre versus post, so on all of them, they actually got a little bit slower in maze two, and all but one of them made more errors. We took a look at your performance, you didn't get slower from maze one to two, you actually got faster. Really? And you made the same exact number of errors. So they don't improve, and you did. And even though this experiment had a small number of subjects, the results are really consistent with our virtual maze study with 70 test subjects. All Thank right. you, video games. What about inside my brain? Inside your brain, it's a little tougher to really tell. We would expect that any effect of this is going to be small. I mean, we couldn't take your hippocampus and make it twice as big because then it would have to be pushing something else out, so it's just not going to be a large change. So where we did find a difference is actually in the shape of the hippocampus. What we saw is there were some regions in the hippocampus on both sides that appeared to have changed shape from day one before gaming to day 10 after gaming. What's really surprising to me is that as an adult, my brain is still changing. That makes me want to take better care of my brain. <laughs> yes. Exercise it more, because it is a thing that can change. It's, I'm not just stuck with what I have now, today. I mean, in all of this, I think that the big takeaway is that doing things, giving your brain something to learn, something to do, something to figure out, this is what we think is actually keeping your brain sharp. One way to do that is to keep watching Minefield. Exactly. <laughs> As our relationship with technology becomes ever stronger, people are bound to worry about what it will do to our brains. Will offloading memory and computing to our machines make us dumber? Will our empathy for machines have negative consequences for how we interact with each other? Well. Let's look back to another time, a new kind of technology threatened to fundamentally change our brains. Two and a half thousand years ago, the Greek philosopher Socrates worried that the wide use of writing would have a negative impact on people's minds. He said that writing would, to quote his student Plato, create forgetfulness because people will not use their memories. They will trust the external, written characters and not remember themselves. Socrates was right. Written language did fundamentally change our brains, but it's also one of the cornerstones of everything modern civilization has accomplished. One of the defining characteristics of being human is that this is not the boundary of my body, 
and this is not the boundary of my mind. And as always, thanks for watching. There you go. Episode is over. How do you feel? I feel good about it. Uh, I liked what we covered about the hippocampus and kind of getting at that slightly counterintuitive idea that the hippocampus is not just short-term memory, but also spatial memory and spatial navigation and how in our own cognition, those two are very tied together. Ooh, right. You had mentioned earlier about memory palaces. Yeah, yeah. So have you ever watched uh, Sherlock? I love Sherlock. I've written plenty of fan fiction about that show. There is this recurring trope in the show where he goes into his, I think he calls it his memory palace, right? Right, right, right. Memory palaces uh, come from this very ancient memorization technique that's actually, it's been used since um, ancient Greece, where I think they called it the method of loci. Yep. And the, the reason it works, so actually to, to explain the method, is basically you imagine some two-dimensional, three-dimensional space that you're familiar with, like your house, and you place an object to be remembered in different locations in the house. So for example, like let's say you walk into the kitchen. So in the kitchen, there's these set of facts and you go into your bedroom and there's these set of facts. And the reason this works is because your hippocampus is very spatial. It organizes information spatially. And this actually has a lot of, um, this has an impact on our cognition. So it, it's also involved in, for example, our sense of time, which is tied to our sense of space. So. Do you ever like walk into a, a new room and then if you forget why you're there? Oh, totally, yeah. That's because your hippocampus. Your hippocampus tied the mental context and certain memories to the room you're in before. Now you walk into a new room, you're in a new spatial context, and it, that context isn't attached to this memory. Wow. Fascinating, yeah. Because <clears throat> it's always kind of, you realize that you don't know why you're there at the same moment that you realize you're there. Exactly. That you're like, all right, new place, and we lost everything that was associated with the last place, didn't we? Shoot, why am I here? Yep, and uh, there's also research um, showing that this can warp your sense of time. So hmm. this is actually research I did uh, back when I was an undergrad on how the hippocampus and other related regions, they encode our sense of the passage of time, or at least our memory for how much time has passed. And so if you constantly switch contexts, for example, by changing rooms or even changing the kinds of things you're thinking about, yeah. you're going to remember more time as having passed. Huh. Interesting. Really? Yeah. And you can manipulate this by even having someone walk into a new room, which is a way of changing context. Right. And so they will think that it's been longer? They'll remember more time as having passed. So uh -huh. your, your memory of time passing isn't exactly the same as your current experience of time passing. Of course. Passing. Of course. Yeah. I can yeah. feel like, man, this is so boring. Later on, I basically feel like it took a second because I've got so few memories from there. Right. That's what it was like being in isolation mm -hmm. in season one, episode one of Minefield. I have like no memories from those three days because nothing happened. I just right. stared at right. white walls all day. And how do you remember time passing when you were in there? It didn't pass. That was the other weird thing. There's this whole soliloquy I gave halfway through, I believe, my stay in that room that isn't in the episode. but. It was something like, wow, I'm not even scared of death anymore because there's nothing to look forward to. Every mm -hmm. moment is the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this is how a bug feels, that mm -hmm. you just exist and there's now and that's all there is. And so death isn't scary. Well, it was, a, it was I, I, a crazy experiment. I doubt a bug would ha be having those thoughts though. I know, I know, <laughs> but I'm just thinking, what is the consciousness of a bug like if it exists yeah. and it might not plan for the future much no. and it might not remember how long ago it did that other thing right. in the past. Right. 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 So it's just kind of the world exists right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, because I have no memories from that, it just felt like it happened like this. But if I look at what I've done in the last three days, especially now as a new dad, yeah. it feels like it's that's it, so much Forever time has passed. passed. Forever has passed yeah. since three days ago. Yep. So we actually did... This wasn't the hippocampus, but it was a, a region right next to it called the entorhinal cortex, mm -hmm. which is kind of the, that's the, the part of the cortex that feeds information into the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. So we looked at how activity there predicts people's sense or memory for time passing. And so what we did is we put people in the scanner and they listened to a short story. And after they left the scanner, we then would play two clips from the story and we asked them, how much time do you remember passing between mm. clip A and clip B? 
And what we found was the more activity changed in their entorhinal cortex in that period, the more time they remembered passing between those two. Wow, fascinating. The idea being, literally, there was more stuff changing in their head in that period. So the perception of time passing, the memory of time passing, mm -hmm. dreams, we've got a lot of material for a season four. What do you say, YouTube? <laughs> All about the hippocampus? All about the I would love to do a themed season. Just every episode is about fear, or every episode is about the hippocampus, yeah. or the cerebellum. I don't care, but there's a lot of cool stuff out there. And Daniel, it's always a pleasure to have you come and share all of your ideas. Yeah, Thanks for always joining. Always fun to be here. That concludes our Mind Field Marathon. For now, will there be a second installment? I hope so. So many incredibly talented people worked on this show. I couldn't have done it without them. You met some of them today, and I'm so grateful to their intelligence and their knowledge and their passion for teaching. If you haven't seen every episode of Minefield yet, please go check them out. Right now, they are free to view all around the world. There's 24 of them. There's playlists on my channel. Check them all out. Uh, I recommend all of them. The mind is a wonderful place, a wonderful field that's sometimes scary as a minefield. Anywho, you know the name of the show. Go check it out. And as always, thanks for watching. That was a blast. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Because you're still watching, I got a little bit of a secret to show you. Okay, this remote I was using the whole time doesn't even have batteries in it. <laughs> Hollywood magic. Everything is smoke and mirrors except Mind Field. It's a very serious show. I'm very proud of it. To watch all of the episodes, you don't have to do too much. All you have to do is click here for season one, here for season two, and here for season three. Have fun, and as always, thanks for watching.